His Excellency Ambassador Don Campbell, Co-Chair of the PECP Standing Committee, Mr. Herizal Hazri, the Chief Executive of ISIS Malaysia, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Selamat pagi, and again, a warm good morning. Welcome to the 27th PECC General Meeting with the theme of optimizing human potential towards the future of shared prosperity and sustainability in times of COVID-19, an event organized by ISIS Malaysia and PECC. To begin today's proceedings, may I please have the honor of inviting Mr. Herizal Hazri, the Chief Executive of ISIS Malaysia, to deliver his opening remarks. Thank, thank you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, Juwita. Yang berhormat Datuk Sri Azmin Ali, His Excellencies Don Campbell and Suji, co-chairs of the uh, PECC, ISIS board members, all of us, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning, selamat pagi from Malaysia. First of all, I'd like to welcome all the PECC co-chairs and PECC members, esteemed speakers, active next generation delegates, and participants from all over the world to our 27th PECC General Meeting and Public Forum. As you know, this year's theme is on optimizing human potential towards a future shared prosperity and sustainability in times of COVID-19, which is very much in line with the APEX theme. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, in these uncertain times, I'm happy that we are still able to come together, albeit um, via the virtual world. It is the first time ever that the PECC general meeting and public forum are held online in its entirety. And I hope our discussions will be fruitful as we enter a world filled with challenges and opportunities beyond 2020. PECC is truly a unique tripartite partnership of senior individuals from business and industry, government, academic, and other intellectual circles as we aim to serve as a regional forum for cooperation and policy coordination to promote economic development in the Asia-Pacific region. ISIS Malaysia has indeed been very active with PECC and we are very happy to play host to this year's general meeting. For the next two days, we will be discussing several timely issues. Today, we will delve into the economic repercussions of the COVID-19 crisis and the future of FTAs in this region. And later, we will also examine the solutions to climate change. Tomorrow, we will discuss the prospects of our youth and unemployment in this region. As the digital economy is growing in the midst of the pandemic, we will also exchange views of what is needed to create an inclusive society through digital trade and SME's participation. I'm also aware that our next generation delegates have started their interactions yesterday so that they are able to follow and contribute to the discussions for the next few days. I am encouraged and I will continue to encourage these young delegates to give their inputs and to be brave in suggesting new ways to improve this network and its programs in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to have the younger, the younger Hormat, Dr. Sri Muhammad Azmin, our Minister of International Trade and Industry, deliver his opening speech today. Due to his busy schedule, we have pre recorded his remarks on Malaysia and APEC post 2020. I hope that the pandemic has not dampened our spirits in strengthening the future of regional cooperation in this region. I hope that we, further can, we, we will further connect ourselves and fuel for collaboration entering a new decade. Thank you very much and have a very fruitful meeting. Thank you so much, Mr. Herizal. May I please have the honor of inviting Ambassador Don Campbell, co-chair of PECC Stand Committee to deliver his opening remarks. Um, the uh, Ambassador, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is my mic, my mic is open? You can hear me? Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. 
uh, from near and afar. And on behalf of my co-chair, Ambassador Suga, and myself, I am delighted uh, to add my welcome uh, to all of the uh, participants uh, in this uh, conference around the Asia Pacific uh, region uh, for this uh, general conference. I would also like to offer my thanks to the Malaysian National Committee for PEC and to Malaysia ISIS, and in particular, its leader, who we've just heard from, Herizal Hazri, uh, for the excellent organization under difficult circumstances uh, that you have made uh, for uh, this uh, PEC uh, week. I really call it a PEC week with the next generation, with the general conference, and then, of course, with the standing committees of, uh, of PEC. This is the, if, I, if I'm counting correctly, this is the 27th uh, general conference of, uh, of PEC, uh, but we are meeting this time under circumstances that I don't think any of us could have found imaginable as recently as a few months ago. So this, in a way, unique <laughs> is a unique conference. Uh, so I, I guess I I'd say that uh, first that uh, PEC has already been very involved uh, in uh, the current set of circumstances. We issued a special report on the state of the region and made a contribution to assessing and offering suggestions on the impact of the COVID uh, crisis uh, globally and in the Asia Pacific region. And it's my hope and expectation that this conference may make a further contribution uh, to the consideration, uh, for the consideration of all of our governments. You have seen the agenda, uh, which is an all-encompassing one looking at e economic repercussions, at uh, the um, initial assessment of the CPTPP, uh, the coming into, uh, uh, into uh, force of the uh, RCEP, accelerating solutions to climate change, youth and jobless, digital economy and how that may uh, feed into a more inclusive uh, uh, economy for all of us, and obviously the role of SMEs in all of this. And I guess I would only say that how we as uh, Asia Pacific governments and societies uh, uh, continue to deal uh, with the COVID crisis itself in terms of the continuing uh, containment measures and adaptation members in terms of um, vaccine distribution, and then more broadly, how we adapt in order for our economies to recover and to prosper is really the defining moment of our age. Uh, I can't under, uh, it's impossible to underestimate the importance of what we do now and the effect that it will have. Uh, we need to recover through openness and, and transparency and a commitment uh, to resisting protectionism and beggaring my neighbors. We need to keep our economies open and our borders uh, 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 in, interconnected. We also, I think, and this is a, in some ways an exciting opportunity in this recovery process, we have an opportunity to address sustainable uh, environmentally positive uh, growth in a way that we have not done to date. And equally important, I think we do have an opportunity uh, in the way in which we uh, recover and develop uh, growth to address the social inequity and the inequality uh, that has existed in our uh, economies and in our society uh, in the past and up until uh, the, uh, the present. So. We're in a situation of significant challenge, of danger of challenge, but I think also of opportunity. Uh, and I think we, uh, as we go through the, uh, the, the work of the two-day uh, conference, which I'm very excited about, uh, I'm hopeful that we will be able to point, uh, uh, provide some, some, some uh, fodder for the discussion that is going on uh, in our governments and in our societies on this very, very, uh, uh, important set of, set of issues. So I wish you and us all well in our deliberations, and I expect that we're going to have a very fruitful uh, 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 conclusion and conversation. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, let us now listen to the keynote address titled Malaysia and Trade Reforms in Uncertain Time, delivered by that YB Dato Sri Muhammad Azwin Ali, the Minister of International Trade and Industry. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. First and foremost, I would like to congratulate the Malaysia National Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperation, as well as ISIS, for hosting today's PECC Standing Committee meeting and public forum. On behalf of Malaysia, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to the distinguished members of the PECC, honored speakers, youth delegates, and participants from all over the world. I thank you all for joining us today. With COVID-19 still hovering over us with its menacing presence and gnawing at our sides, there is no gain saying that this forum acquires added significance as well as urgency. Since the WHO first declared it as a pandemic in March 2020, innumerable stakeholder engagements have been convened, underscoring the severity and gravity of the impact of the pandemic across all strata of society. In our efforts to combat this crisis and to flatten the curve, a tsunami of unintended economic consequences was unleashed, setting forth a massive global economic downturn. For the APEC region, economic growth is now expected to decline by 2.5% for 2020, bringing total output losses to a staggering 1.8 trillion US dollars. In the first six months of 2020, the region's growth declined by 3.7% due to travel restrictions and widespread lockdown measures. Ladies and gentlemen, the fundamental question remains, do we raise our arms in despair and set ourselves up for a self-fulfilling prophecy of doom and gloom? Or do we instead steal our resolve and by a series of integrated measures and structural reforms overcome this crisis? If indeed we take the latter course and if Schumpeter's doctrine of creative destruction holds true, then I do believe that post COVID-19 this region will emerge even stronger and more vibrant, not just on trade and commerce, but with positive geostrategic and geoeconomic dimensions. While the economic fallout from COVID-19 has caused major disruptions in global supply chains, movement of people and sent unemployment rates to all time highs, it has also ushered in the much needed structural and progressive reforms, as well as the fortitude for continuous improvements in the APEC region. This, no doubt, includes comprehensive and massive economic stimulus measures calculated not only to boost activity and stir economic recovery, but also to remedy the structural of the back of that. our systems. Well, we also in saw times of uncertainty like this would and... include removing structural barriers to improve access to economic opportunity that would bolster recovery and help economies reach a higher growth trajectory. In this regard, it bears stressing apex three pillar structural reform agenda of developing more open, well-functioning, transparent, and competitive markets, deepening the participation of all segments of society, and establishing sustainable social policies. On the part of Malaysia, 
Our structural reform efforts are targeted towards elimination of non-tariff barriers by way of streamlining processes, reducing costs and time with regard to carrying out trade activities. These measures will further enhance the ease of doing business. Other structural reforms include efforts to accelerate automation, digitalization, and labor reskilling within the domestic industry. From a broader perspective, the region will require a long-term strategic blueprint that would pave the way for sustained and vibrant growth built on the edifice of a rules-based multilateral trading system that is free, fair and open. In this regard, I dare say that we have reason to be optimistic in view of the remarkable achievements on the two documents that have significant bearing towards the region's recovery and future growth trajectory. Firstly, the APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040 that was launched at the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting 2020. And secondly, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement that was signed at the margins of the recent ASEAN Summit. As the host of the recently concluded APEC 2020, Malaysia takes pride in our key deliverables for the year, specifically the APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040 now serves as the primary APEC reference for the next two decades. Encapsulating our geostrategic aspirations and Putrajaya vision calls for an open, dynamic, resilient and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2040 for the prosperity of all our people and future generations. The geoeconomic dimensions are equally significant as the vision identifies three economic drivers to achieve our long-term goals, namely trade and investment, innovation and digitalization, as well as strong, balanced, secure, sustainable and inclusive growth. The RCEP agreement has brought into existence the world's largest FTA, and is of immense significance to us as free trading nations, strengthened by the bonds of enhanced regional economic cooperation. RCEP will also pave the critical pathway for the eventual realization of the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. To my mind, FTAAP has vast potential for uplifting the living standards and welfare of participating APEC economies as it provides the turbo charge to economic growth in the region. Be that as it may, I firmly believe that APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040, coupled with the RCEP agreement, would be able to deepen regional economic integration, bringing forth a vast array of multiplier effects. Both will be game changers, tools to invigorate growth and will holistically serve to facilitate trade as well as attract even greater investments that is set to benefit the region as a whole. In this regard, the mantra of no one left behind is very much in line with Melissa's aspiration of seeing the concept of shared prosperity embedded in APEC work, particularly in ensuring participation of all segments of society in economic activities, thereby creating new growth areas. As we pursue regional solutions that strike a balance between economic prosperity and sustainable growth, APEC economies need to act together in solidarity to continue reaffirming our support and commitment to the rules-based multilateral trading system that is free, fair and open. The 21 APEC economies have done just that this year through a series of commitments in facilitating the movement of essential goods and services 
in the region, including our pledge via the Kuala Lumpur Declaration issued by the economic leaders on 20th November 2020. Commitment to structural reforms will ring hollow unless we recognize the imperative of ensuring fiscal sustainability and transparency for long-term economic growth and resilience. In order to ensure that more layers of society can benefit from such growth, APEC should accord its priority to promoting digital inclusion, especially for the marginalized and vulnerable communities. I also call for APEC regional initiatives and policies to consider outright support that ensures recovery and growth for the MSMEs and to bring direct benefit to the self-employed, those in the informal sectors, women, youth and others with untapped economic potential. In closing, I believe that the way ahead lies not in stronger barriers and higher walls of protectionism. On the contrary, the way forward is none other than the rules-based multilateral trading system supported firmly by the implementation of the crucial structural reforms. For the fruits of free, fair and open trade to be felt more broadly and equitably, what is needed is not a retreat into the insular, but rather the reaching out to the collective. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. May I please now pass the floor to my fellow colleague, Mr. Harris, to be the MC for the next coming session. The floor is yours, Harris. Thank you, Dr. Juita, for MCing the event thus far. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harris Zainal and I'll be the MC for the rest of today's proceedings. To move things along, may I please have the honor of calling upon Dr. Narongchai Akrasani to moderate Plenary Session 1, Economic Repercussions of the COVID-19 Crisis. Dr. Narongchai, the floor is yours for the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or fellow uh, PECC and participants. Uh, I'd like to start the session by uh, introducing the conference theme. This has been uh, distributed even to all of us to emphasize the title is Optimizing Human Potential Towards a Future of Shared Prosperity and Sustainability in Times of COVID-19. To paraphrase uh, this uh, rather long theme, Basically, what, what we want is that what do we do now and going forward for a better future? That's the main message. What do we do now? The future of shared prosperity and sustainability in times of COVID-19. This is the conference. Next is the session theme, the one that we are going to hear uh, from speaker now. We... Uh, talk about economic repercussions of the COVID-19 crisis. We know that economic situations have been problematic in general in the last few years, then made worsen by COVID-19 from Q2 uh, 2020. Uh, what it means is that we, we had problems before. We had trade and tech uh, conflicts before. We had interventions which created market distortions. Then the whole thing was made worse by COVID-19. So now, now, now what we have with, with uh, trade tensions and near collapse global economy, the question is how do we minimize trade tensions using EPEC mechanism to mitigate risk? And how do we cooperate to keep the global economy particularly epic economy going. These are the basic questions we have for this first session. For us, we have uh, speakers. Originally, there were a few more than just two speakers. But because of unforeseen circumstances, 
now we have only two speakers, which means we have more time for them to tell us what they think. The first speaker would be uh, Vangelis uh, Vitalis, Mr. Vangelis Vitalis. He's a SOM chair of APEC uh, 2021. And the second speaker is Richard Record from World Bank Malaysia. We have one hour all together. For each speaker, uh, we can hear from them 15 minutes each. Then we can have discussion for about close to half an hour. May I now invite uh, Mr. Vangelis Vitalis, the SOM chair of APEC 2021, to present uh, his uh, thought about the subject. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind um, invitation uh, to join uh, the seminar. I was very grateful um, when I got it, um, not least because I'm aware of the central role that PEC plays um, across a whole range of the trade and policy um, in the trade policy sphere across the, the Asia Pacific um, area. I wanted to speak today sort of in, um, I guess, two distinct parts. First of all, to sketch a little bit of the context as we see it from a kind of a, a New Zealand perspective, as we pick up the hosting responsibility um, from uh, Malaysia. Uh, so to sketch out first the context and then to turn uh, very briefly around the regional context before I then turn very specifically to what APEC might do this year and what we are um, looking to do with our host year, building, of course, on um, the quite significant achievement uh, of Malaysia um, this year. And I want to kind of touch on that uh, near the end of my section. So look, let me start with... Um, the first big theme, I guess, is one of uncertainty. Uh, and there are seven elements to that uncertainty that, that, that I see. The first is obviously the, the virus itself. So COVID-19 and the health effects, um, as we observe what's going on in Europe where there's lockdown after lockdown happening, um, I think, and even though we have some positive uh, news around the vaccines and so on, what is clear is that we and exporters and importers are going to have to function and operate in a world of considerable uncertainty around the health aspects of the crisis. The second is, is to state the obvious, and it was picked up by the previous speaker as well, and, and by you, um, is of course the, um, uh, the economic shock that we now face. And there are, there are signs of a global economic recovery uh, that that is gradually starting to pick up, that that trajectory is moving in the, in the broadly in the right direction and the Asia Pacific's on the right side of that ledger in the way that perhaps the Americas and Europe are not yet. But nevertheless, I think there's no room for complacency there. The third big challenge I see in terms of uncertainty relates to protectionism. So the rising trend um, that's observable now with the installation of export response uh, tariff measures being taken, both tariff and non-tariff measures, and of course, um, uh, government interventions to support um, various industries ranging from the agriculture right through to the manufacturing sector, and what that's going to do in terms of chilling um, trade flows. The fifth area, sorry, that was the fourth area, um, is of course the fragmentation of the rules-based system. So this is a very troubling development uh, that has been accelerated by COVID-19. Uh, and it is not at all clear that the appellate body at the World Trade Organization will be swiftly uh, reinstalled. Um, it's worth remembering, of course, that uh, it was the Obama administration that started the process of not joining a consensus in order to appoint uh, appellate body members uh, to their structure. So I don't assume that that's a given, that that is very quickly going to come back. So again, another factor driving uncertainty uh, in our region. The the sixth area I want to identify is public scepticism about trade. Um, I think that that has been a long-standing concern. Um, lesser feature, perhaps, in, in our part of the world, seeing one internationally, particularly in developed economies, um, a concern around um, trade, uh, sovereignty questions, impact on, um, on employment, uh, and so on. But now bound in, and this is again a function of COVID-19, um, concerns that imported food may not be safe, uh, that imported products uh, might bring the virus with them, all feeding a further sort of sense of anxiety about international trade flows that, again, um, 
makes for a, a somewhat more uncertain environment. And then, to put it politely, the US-China relationship, how will that unfold and the level of uncertainty around what that means both for the region and, and of course, internationally. So that's kind of the, the contextual um, elements that we see as we pick up our host year. And I guess, as I said at the start, the overriding theme then is one of uncertainty. Uh, and then the question becomes, so how do you manage this uncertainty? And if you are thinking in the trade policy world, what structures, what institutions do you have that can help manage and mitigate posed uh, by this level of uncertainty? And look, the previous, um, the minister identified uh, two very important aspects of mitigating that kind of risk. Uh, and that is clearly CPTPP and, and of course RCEP. So those two pillars of our trade architecture, our emerging and evolving trade architecture are going to be very important ones to try to even out and stabilize um, the levels of uncertainty across the region. So I do think RCEP um, was a very significant development uh, at this point in sort of the COVID-19 trajectory to be able to conclude a major agreement like that. The non-trivial fact of uh, Japan, Korea, and China being able to agree in a, a trade agreement between them uh, needs to be understood as a, as a genuinely um, important milestone in our region's um, uh, development. So the, you've got these two pillars and then the part of the New Zealand strategy that we have been prosecuting um, over the last four years has been one that acknowledges that at the WTO, uh, of course, that remains easily the most important institution for us all internationally, but an acknowledgement, of course, that one can't do everything at the World Trade Organization at present, and therefore what we are calling concerted open pluralateralism is, is an, a, another way of trying to support the rules-based system, support multilateralism, by essentially concluding um, high-quality comprehensive agreements in interesting new areas that can push out new rules, um, new trade rules, still international trade treaties that are legally enforceable, but they shore up the existing system and hopefully extend it a little bit as well. A good recent example of that is the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement signed between Chile, um, Singapore, and, and New Zealand. Um, that's an important example of three small economies getting together and saying, we need to have some agency in the way in which rules in the digital sphere are constructed. Um, we don't want these rules simply to be imposed on us. Instead, we want to have an opportunity to shape and inform the regional development of those rules. So the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement very much in that strategic perspective. Concerted open pluralateralism means that a small agreement like that between three small partners is useful, and it is genuinely useful to all three of us. If you look at some of the commitments there on electronic certification procedures, electronic signature recognition, electronic um, uh, certificate templates, um, those are genuine practical you know, they save business money. Um, but what the real uh, opportunity is, is for larger economies to either join the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement directly, so to accede to the agreement, to see it as a vehicle for their own integration into the Asia Pacific, or to use elements of what we negotiated uh, in their own uh, agreement. So the, if you look at the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement on our, available on our website, you will see that it has been deliberately constructed in a series of modules. That modular approach allows other economies to pluck out particular modules um, and use them, and we hope that they do. So we have a, um, a sort of a, a shared uh, sense of um, the opportunity that these new agreements might be able to um, provide uh, the region, and we're not at all precious about how those will function. Um, and that brings me now, so that, that these are the kind of the hard rules, um, systems, the architecture that we've got in the region. Very importantly, though, is the so-called soft rules, the institutions that create the ecosystem from which these hard rules are derived. And this is where APEC um, comes in. APEC is the ecosystem from which we develop standards, the way we think about rules and norms, and then those rules and norms then get picked up in our trade agreements in the in the hard rules. So we need to see APEC as that opportunity, that incubator of good ideas, of interesting thoughts, of different perspectives, and a safe way in which the economies in the region can come together and think about and challenge each other about some of the more interesting 
uh, developments across the um, across the region, what that might mean in the trade and economic sphere. And that's very much the way we're thinking about our host year. Which brings me then to say, um, the first thing we need to acknowledge is the tremendous service that Malaysia has rendered uh, both the region, uh, all of us, all 21 economies, um, but also to the institution APEC itself. APEC had been having um, a challenging previous two or three years where we were not able to get consensus, where meetings were cancelled, unfortunately, due to other uh, unrelated, uh, APEC unrelated reasons, but nevertheless, meetings didn't happen um, that were important milestones um, in APEC's kind of progress, the, the progress that it makes uh, across the region. What Malaysia did, therefore, is not only stabilize the ship, if you like, um, and place APEC back at the heart of the, the region's integration project, but it also was able to advance it. And for concrete evidence of that is very much in the action plan, uh, the Putrajaya vision that you, sorry, the Putrajaya vision that you heard the minister speak about, which, as the minister said, charts out for the next 20 the work program of, um, of our region uh, and how we are going to kind of think about integration, think about uh, economic reform, think about um, how our trade policy needs to work, and indeed think about some of those other big issues that are driving uncertainty, not least, of course, uh, climate change. So Malaysia's um, uh, work to deliver a consensus statement, the Putrajaya vision, provides a crucial foundation for what we will try to do. And the most important thing that New Zealand will be trying to do in its host year is to uh, prepare uh, what, what's known as the action plan. In other words, the implementation agenda that comes out of the Putrajaya vision. And that action plan will be our main task uh, for the year, because that is, of course, where we have the so-called work program that will set out for 20 years what it is we as economies in the region will now be working on as we go forward. And that is, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, well understood at our end that that is a um, for us into the region. And that then brings me to the way in which New Zealand has sought to frame um, its year. We've thought about our year in three distinct parts, and these quite deliberately have a resonance in the, in the Putrajaya vision. The first cluster of work is around the trade, the classical trade and economic um, policy areas. So things like macroeconomic reform, uh, some of the microeconomic reform elements that finance ministers might like to be thinking about, and of course, the more classical trade policy elements. Um, for example, um, as Malaysia's minister uh, observed, one of the big achievements of Malaysia's year was this uh, declaration that um, APEC ministers issued on um, essential goods. The interesting question I think now is, can APEC agree what those goods might actually be? And indeed, could we also agree, could we also discuss which services we might need to think about? Which are the services that enable the trade in PPEs? What are the services that are needed to deliver effectively the vaccine across the region? So there are some interesting trade policy questions that we might want to explore. Still, as I said, the classical trade and economic sphere the WTO Ministerial Conference will be held next year, most likely near the end of the year and almost certainly after um, our own MRT and indeed most likely the leaders uh, meeting as well. That's an opportunity too for APEC to think quite it might lean in uh, to support the rules-based system in practical and concrete ways. And I want to touch on those as I come into the second and third clusters of work that we have in mind. So that first cluster is the trade and economic um, area, um, and clearly uh, thinking about the COVID-19 essential goods and services in the vaccine area is a way for APEC to signal its responsiveness uh, to the current pandemic. The second broad area of work that we have in mind is around sustainability and inclusion, and again, drawing directly out of the Putrajaya vision uh, language. Here you could see work being done on environmental goods and services, where already APEC has a vener venerable history as the only institution that has produced an environmental goods list, only 50 data on the list in 2012, is it time nearly a decade later to expand that list is one of the questions we're going to be asking. The CPC codes for services, environmental services, date back to the early 1990s and the late 1980s. Is it time to update those? Surely over the last 20 to 30 years, 
uh, environmental services delivery uh, and indeed the range of environmental services that now exist has fundamentally changed and needs a more aggregate, uh, a more disaggregated um, set of, um, uh, of coding. Then is there something we can do again in the WTO space that's practical and relevant to members, uh, member economies? Uh, for example, if uh, the WTO is able to deliver a fish subsidies outcome at some point uh, next year, um, is there a role for APEC in a WTO implementation and monitoring um, uh, role to help support the region implement effectively, uh, you know, what the outcome might be on IUU fishing, for example, or overfishing and overcapacity uh, measures. So that's one of the other areas, again, the practical sustainability and inclusion piece that we could look at. There's also going to be a very interesting piece of work that will be progressed through um, the year, which is, of course, the indigenous economy. So the contribution of the indigenous economy to our regions, what does that look like? We've done a lot of work in New Zealand in our own economy, but we don't really have a good understanding of what happens in many of the other economies. And that piece of work might be quite an interesting way of exploring what next and what other interesting areas in the indigenous trade um, space uh, that member economies might want to have a look at. So the trade and economic, the classical piece, the sustainability and the inclusion piece, again, Putrajaya vision, um, uh, references. And then the third, which is very much a Putrajaya vision, and indeed I, I heard the Malaysian minister talk about this um, in some detail, is of course the digital and innovation piece. So how is it? What structural reforms drive innovation? How do we think about both the macro and the microeconomic instruments that help, that help generate um, the innovation that drives the digital? We know that the digital sphere can be a driver of productivity. What we don't know, how precisely um, the standards and norms that we might be able to uh, think about in the digital sphere might help, again, just sand away some of the, um, the uncertainty that exists out there internationally. Now, none of us is naive, of course, in the digital sphere, how significant the challenges are, given the particular different approaches that major economies uh, within the APEC family have to some of these issues, if you think about privacy, commercial confidentiality, data localization. The trick for APEC will be what can it navigate successfully within that, within that 20, within those 24 members that actually has meaning um, for our exporters uh, as well as our importers um, throughout the region. So this is another area where we're going to be focusing uh, a considerable part of our um, effort. So in conclusion, um, and I see now I'm a minute over time, um, I did want to sort of say um, the, the key theme that we see in our year emerging is clearly uncertainty, global uncertainty around the health crisis, the economic crisis, to be responsive to that. And into that breach, we have APEC, the perfect vehicle, uh, the a really great institution that can help us mitigate some of those risks out there, mitigate some of those uncertainties, and send a clear, sharp message that not just internationally, but within our own region about rebuilding confidence uh, in the rules-based system, in uh, supply lines, uh, responding to the crisis itself very directly, both in terms of the meetings that happen, but also in terms of the concrete deliverables. So if there was one thing to leave you with, it is that APEC has a role, that there is an urgency to this, but above all that APEC uh, member economies have agency in the way in which we now frame up the response to uh, what is a global health and economic crisis. So my thanks again, and I do look very much forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vitalis. Basically, uh, Dr. Vitalis uh, was telling us about uh, the managing the year of uncertainty 2021. Interestingly, uh, Thailand is now preparing to be the host of EPEC 2022. The title is Managing the Year of Recovery. So we are optimistic you know, that 2022 will be the year of recovery. Now we will hear from uh, Dr. Richard Record about what he sees as the economy uh, going uh, for, this, for next year and whether it's going to be correct that 2022 will be the year of recovery. Please, Dr. Uh, Richard Record. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Narong Chai, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Vangelis, as well, for those comments that are interesting. So let me perhaps give a, a, I'm going to give a few slides that perhaps hopefully will, will complement some of the points that have already been made. Uh, and if you'll 
bear with, uh, bear with me for a moment. Let me... Uh, Okay, so in broad times, let me sort of talk you through how we see the, the sort of economic storyline um, over this year and going into next year, and, and perhaps some some hints going into to 2022. Um, I think actually, Narongchai, uh, Dr. Narongchai, your question is very short and simple, but actually it's very complicated to answer. And um, I think in, in economic terms, this has been a, a phenomenally uh, challenging time to, to make any kind of projection. And... Um, like many of my fellow economists, this is a year of being wrong mostly, um, and uh, hopefully we learn a few lessons uh, for next year beyond that. Uh, so I'm hoping everybody can see the, the slideshow here. Um, so I, I have a few slides. Presentation is essentially what I call from containment to recovery. Um, that picture you see on the, on the cover page is actually some of the, the frontliners in, uh, here in Malaysia um, who have engaged, of course, like in countries uh, right across APEC in the, in the, the fight against the, the pandemic. So starting sort of at the, the global level, um, I mean, what, what's striking this year is just how, how synchronized um, this, this crisis has been. That, that chart goes back all the way to 1871. Um, the red line shows the number of countries which have experienced a, a contraction or a recession um, and uh, the orange dots are perhaps a sort of indication of the depth of that contraction. Um, in fact, in, in modern economic history, we've never seen a time where we've seen so many economies simultaneously in recession, well over 90%, I think, I think it's almost 95% this year. Um, that's higher than we saw in, you know, in, in the two world wars and, and of course in the, the Great Depression. Now, of course, maybe we might argue that actually the depth of the contraction um, in the 1940s and in the 1930s was a little deeper. Um, but clearly when we use the word unprecedented, uh, maybe it's, it, it's not sort of hyperbolic this year. Of course, as, as colleagues already discussed, East, East Asia and the APEC region has, done, uh, has managed to sort of mitigate, contain and, and respond to the, the crisis somewhat better than other regions having sort of experienced it first. Um, we, you know, we were all used to these sort of um, exponential charts showing the number of infections and so on. I won't spend too long. Um, although perhaps it is important to highlight that even within APEC we're seeing, uh, and within East Asia, we're seeing significant divergence um, in the, the sort of impact of the pandemic on, on economic outcomes. Um, what's striking, of course, is, is when you look at East Asia as a region or APEC, um, there's a very different performance whether you include China or not. Um, of course, we all know China is an incredibly large economy, and if you include China in the averages for the region as a whole, then in 2020 we would expect the region to, to just escape a recession with a, um, a modest uh, sort of modicum, uh, one to two percent of positive growth. Of course, if you look at the region excluding China, then it's very clear we're seeing a, a region-wide recession. And of course, by by the regional standards, you know you have to go back um, again, perhaps not quite as, as deep as the, the Asian financial crisis. Um, but again, we haven't seen a sort of simultaneous shock until since the 1960s on a, on a similar scale. Um, we try in the World Bank side to sort of try and collect data, high frequency data on the household level and at the firm level. Um, and all the indicators we see show, unsurprisingly, substantial drop um, in, in economic activity uh, and, well, and well-being and welfare, both at the household level as well as at the firm level. Um, and that sort of mirrors the, the economic contraction that we've seen right across, across the region. Certainly all the evidence suggests as well that it's micro and small firms that have been most affected. And of course, firms which are most reliant on domestic economic activity. Um, and so that does give rise to sort of some concerns about the distributional impact of, of the pandemic. Um, you know, hiding behind those aggregate numbers of a contraction in, in economic activity, um, we know some households and some individuals and some firms have experienced much larger drops uh, in, in, in economic welfare compared to others. And so as, as part of this, and, and we, we Based here in Malaysia, we, we, we supported particular this year uh, during the finance minister's process for APEC uh, 2020. Um, and there's been a lot of work to try and sort of assess, compare and, and, and learn lessons from the, the type of fiscal support that governments across the region have put in place um, to respond to, to, to this pandemic. Um, now, I, I perhaps ask you not to, to worry too much about the exact numbers. There's a lot of debate about um, you know, what's included in the definition of fiscal and non-fiscal measures. Um, but clearly, this is a, a region where we've seen almost uh, without exception, a large uh, 
public sector support to, to blunt the impact of the crisis, uh, attempt to blunt and mitigate. Um, and we've seen you know, level uh, you know, responses in terms of fiscal and, and public sector responses never seen before in, in terms of economic history. In fact, many of the, the middle income countries in, in the region um, propose, pro, you know, implemented responses very consistent with what we see in advanced economies. Um, if you include financial sector measures, several, several re, uh, had responses around 20% of GDP. We've also seen an incredible um, sort of acceleration in social protection. Um, this is a, a region that's traditionally had a, a relatively thin social safety net um, and has sort of essentially seen well-being driven by rapid rates of growth and job, job creation. Um, 2020 was a, a year that we saw a massive increase in, in social protection system right across the region, again, as governments look to, to mitigate the impact of the crisis on, on household well-being, particularly among the vulnerable. However, despite, uh, perhaps inevitably, of course, like the rest of the world, you know, while there have been a significant and valiant efforts to, to limit the impact of the shock, um, this is a year that's having major impacts on at the country level. Um, by our estimation, we think Vietnam and China will escape um, a, a recession this year. Uh, Myanmar is about on the line, uh, and it may well drop below the line, and pretty much everyone else is seeing negative growth. Um, that chart on the right-hand side shows some of the Pacific Islands, which are on a, an even deeper scale. Uh, I, mean, I think PG looks to be, by our estimation, the economy worst affected, and could see as much as a quarter of GDP knocked off um, this year. Um, so these are numbers that are, that, that are clearly quite striking. Um, from our perspective, we actually try to sort of present this in terms of a triple shock. Um, the, the first dimension, of course, is the direct health impact um, from those uh, share of the population who've been affected by the pandemic. Then as the, the impact of movement control and, and quarantine restrictions within economies that have, had a, have been attempting to suppress the pandemic. Um, and then, of course, the third dimension that is perhaps most uh, challenging in, in APEC is the growth impact from the rest of the world. You know, this is a region where you know, most economies trade heavily, well over 100% of GDP, some of them even over 200% of GDP. And so if we see a global shock um, to, to trade and economic activity, then it, it very quickly passes through to, to country level outcomes in, in this particular region. Um, of course, prior to 2020, one of the, the tremendous successes in this region was that strong correlation between economic growth and poverty reduction. Um, driven mostly by, by job creation and an open international integration of, uh, approach to, to public policy. Um, the challenge, of course, this year is not just the impact of the crisis, but if we compare the sort of pre-COVID trend and trajectory of economic growth um, and what we're seeing afterwards. And so there's an incredible sort of lost or opportunity cost of, of lost poverty reduction that didn't happen because, because of uh, COVID and, and the related sort of response to it. Um, by our estimation, again, prior to COVID, we were expecting another 25 million uh, people in China to be lifted out of poverty and another 8 million uh, people outside China in the region to be lifted out of poverty uh, based on pre-COVID growth rates. Um, of course, China will avoid a recession, but uh, given substantially lower gro growth, uh, a much smaller share of the population um, will be lifted above the poverty line. And of course, outside China will actually see an increase in poverty um, by about sort of 12 to 13 million. So altogether, some 48 million people could be, or in, in all likelihood by our estimation, be pushed back into poverty this year. And that's a reversal we haven't seen in an awfully long time in, 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 uh, in this region. So how do we sort of map out some of those, those implications? Um, our, our concern, of course, is, and uh, as an economist, well, this year has been a, a fascinating one where we've developed a new lexicon of economic jargon. Uh, we started talking about a V-shaped recovery in the hope that we'd see a bounce back quickly. Um, that moved into sort of discussions around U or L-shaped economies, or W. Um, I think the one that, that I think is perhaps most illustrative and most concerning is the discussion of what we call a K-shaped uh, recovery, meaning that some people or some sectors of the economy might recover faster, while others, uh, other sectors, other shares of the population see a much more uh, sustained uh, impact from, from the crisis. Clearly, of course, though, in terms of public investment, we've seen a, a massive fiscal response across the region, um, and that's put equally massive strains on, on public debt. Um, again, given relatively weak tax systems in many of the developing economies in the region, a heavy reliance on indirect taxation, uh, as well as a sort of hefty use of tax incentives to support uh, and sustain growth and, and, and jobs, um, that's put a lot of pressure on, on fiscal balances across the region and will inevitably 
uh, pose a drag on public investment post post crisis. And I think one of the biggest challenges we see for policymakers is trading off the, the, the returns on spending today uh, to support household and, and firm well-being versus having the space to spend tomorrow to support a, a recovery in terms of investment growth. We worry equally about human capital erosion. Um, that's not just in terms of the sort of sickness um, from those infected by, uh, affected by the pandemic, but most significantly by the prolonged educational closures or shift to online learning. I think the big challenge and that perhaps distinguishes the advanced economies from the developing economies is the, the sort of um, lack of provision or lack of quality provision for virtual schooling for a significant share of the population in the region, um, likely to have long lasting implications on quality of human capital formation, especially as the region looks towards innovation led growth in the future. We worry, of course, that private investment has been massively suppressed, unsurprisingly, throughout this year, uh, given the enormous uncertainty. Even if we do see a return to growth year, next year, it's going to be characterized by uncertainty and uneven growth, um, which is likely to weigh heavily on, on private investment confidence, um, certainly in sectors which are more affected by, by, uh, by panic, pandemic containment measures, particularly in services. And then finally, there's this open question on productivity. Now we know in this region, productivity was slowing, uh, or productivity growth was slowing already before, before the crisis. It was possibly linked to the, the sort of slowdown in, in trade integration and that sort of slower rate of trade growth um, in the last decade. Um, there may be sort of some positive signs around accelerated, accelerated digital adoption um, during, during this year, which could, could help with productivity performance going forward. But certainly, you know, in all likelihood, experience from past crises show that there are longer lasting disruption and costs associated with, with closures, with uh, suspended operations, um, and with some breakages in international trade, uh, global value chains. So speaking a little bit more about that, um, of course, you know, in the short term, from an economic perspective, we see a, a sort of contraction of growth this year. Um, expectations uh, for a recovery or rebound in growth next year. Um, the more interesting or perhaps more worrying question is, will there be a, a sustained impact on potential growth over, over the years ahead? Um, so might the pandemic have a, a longer term impact on the ability on the sort of underlying growth rate of economies in the region due to perhaps damage to human capital formation, uh, damage to uh, sort of private sector confidence and damage to the ability of public sector uh, investment capabilities in, in the region. Um, now this real, you know, does require a various set of assumptions depending on you know, different pathways for the pandemic. But certainly that's it's a very real risk as we would see it. And potentially we could see as much as one percentage point knocked off uh, regional growth, regional potential growth for as much as a decade if some of these sort of uh, you know, policy, policy challenges are not appropriately addressed, particularly around, around human capital um, and, and productivity and, and, and investor confidence. So increasingly, I think this will be something that we think will be important for policymakers to address, not just the rebound next year, but trying to address some of the, the longer term challenges that, or, or costs that might be associated with the damage which was done in 2020. So in terms of, sort of policy, policy messages, um, let me just highlight a few of those. Um, fiscal has been a, you know, a key challenge, and of course, this was a, a big part of the discussion during the finance minister's process this year, including during the virtual finance minister's meeting um, a couple months ago. Um, the challenge, of course, is, you know, I think APEC economies have rightly uh, and appropriately uh, invested heavily in, in counter-cyclical fiscal policy in response to the crisis and to try and sort of blunt the impact, particularly on vulnerable households. Um, but of course, that's come on a, on a tax framework which was relatively weak beforehand. As I mentioned before, this is, a, you know, this is a region which depends heavily on indirect taxation, so consumption taxes and on corporate tax, taxation, both of which, of course, have been heavily impacted by the crisis and both will be hard to, to sort of roll back afterwards. You know, during a period when households are going to be under pressure, cost of living concerns and welfare are going to be high on the agenda, it'll be hard, frankly, to rebuild fiscal, fiscal space on the indirect side. It'll be hard to rebuild on the corporate side given concerns about low investment. Um, and again, this is frankly a region that perhaps now is the time to really think about energy subsidies and, and carbon taxation and maybe new sources of revenue to rebuild fiscal space in readiness for, for the next crisis that might come along. Secondly, let me highlight financial prudence. Again, uh, we've seen many economies around the region rightly and appropriately use um, financial sector measures, including uh, sort of regulatory forbearance, 
to provide breathing room and space to, to banks and corporates um, in response to the crisis and to essentially sort of absorb the shock. Um, but of course, that comes with an incredible risk that we might see sort of a, a breakdown of financial discipline and financial sustainability if those measures are not carefully rolled back um, as growth, as growth uh, resumes. Let me also highlight social protection. This has been a year where we've seen, frankly, I would say sort of 30 years of reform in the space of about six months. Country after country sort of rolled out large scale cash transfer social protection programs, um, very effectively in many cases, providing sort of essential support to vulnerable households. Um, a lot of lessons I think have been learned around the importance of national ID systems, around digital transactions, and digital mechanisms to, to distribute those social, those, those, uh, social protection mechanisms. Um, and perhaps the question now is, well, what's the sort of medium term framework um, in readiness for future shocks? And finally, trade as well. That's of course been the big one. And I'm sure my, my colleagues will say much more about this as well. Um, it's sort of heartening um, that we've seen, you know, this is the region which has sort of doubled down on trade and acceleration of, of, uh, of RCEP, just at a time when there are many questions in other parts of the world around uh, the utility of, of a sort of open in, in, uh, integrated approach to internationalism. Um, I think there's still perhaps much further to go on services in particular. We know this has been a, a tough agenda to move forward on, um, but particularly as many of economies in this region move from sort of low, low middle to, to upper middle income economies. In fact, many of them, including Malaysia, look towards becoming a high income economy in the years ahead. Services are becoming an increasingly important part of job creation and economic activity. Um, it's an area where perhaps some of the trade commitments have been a little bit slower and, and less, less ambitious. And of course, that's the part um, where there are many more questions in terms of a post-COVID recovery strategy. Uh, we've already seen this incredible bounce back in goods trade. Um, it's still a little bit tougher to, to see how services might, might move ahead uh, robustly. So finally, let me just add a couple of slides since I, I sit in Malaysia um, uh, on, on that. Of course, um, although I think you will see in, in these charts um, patterns that are mirrored across most of the middle income economies um, of this region. Um, clearly a, a massive shock in the second quarter here. Um, I've never done a, a GDP quarterly chart that goes down as far as negative 20%. Um, I doubt many other economists have done that too. Um, we saw a, a sort of bounce back in, in the third quarter. Um, it remains to be seen what happens in the, the fourth quarter. Um, but, but you know, you can see that sort of shock across all drivers of growth, uh, private consumption, public uh, con investment and consumption and, and exports in the second quarter. Um, that sort of surge in inventories um, in the second quarter, and then a, a little bit of a bounce back in, in terms of exports um, in, the, in the third quarter. And we're optimistic, certainly on the export side, all the high frequency data suggests that APEC economy will continue to see growth in trade in the fourth quarter, but a much more mixed performance on investment and consumption. Looking into next year, um, again, with significant uncertainty, I think, but with you know, allied to many other economies in, in the region, and especially the middle income economies, we expect to see a, a rebound. Now, part of that is a base effect. Um, if you knock off five plus percent of GDP this year, um, you know, smaller growth next year sort of comes back as a, as a bigger headline number. Um, certainly, we expect to see a, a strong recovery on the export uh, and trade side. Um, consumption is really very much dependent on deployment of a vaccine and the effectiveness of suppression strategies. Uh, there's still a number of questions around that, so a lot of uncertainty. Um, and related to that, uh, perhaps a sort of diverging performance on the investment side. Um, those public economies that have the space to invest on the public sector side uh, will almost certainly do so. Uh, private investment, we less so in the services areas where, we, where there's greater uncertainty around consumption. Finally, just perhaps some of the policy messages we've been conveying in Malaysia, but I think many of these apply um, beyond. I think the challenge, of course, here is, is some of those trade-offs between the, the short to the medium term. Um, it really is a question of how much fiscal space can be created in the short term. And like several economies across the region, we've seen changes to fiscal rules uh, to give governments a little bit more space to borrow more and borrow for short-term purposes in response to the crisis. But of course, that depletes fiscal buffers for the next crisis um, in the future and limits the space for public investment to support a, a, a growth in, 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 the, in the years ahead. Of course, from the, I wouldn't be a World Bank economist if I didn't talk about structural measures that we think are very important, um, particularly for the, the middle-income economies in, in this region around the upskilling and of the workforce, sort of shift to, to digital uh, adoption, digital skills, um, and the importance of perhaps shifting the investment uh, promotion framework from one that's focused around quantity 
to one which is focused around quality, um, which is uh, the greater challenge uh, going forward. Um, that sort of brings me to the end of uh, the presentation. Um, in terms of the, the, the framework to 2022, um, now that seems an awfully long way away, um, given everything we've seen in the last year. I think we'd be optimistic though, that you know, if 2021 is the year of rebound, although it'll be uncertain and uneven, but certainly by, by the end of next year, we hope to see vaccines deployed across most of the region in reasonable numbers. Um, we see a sort of recovery in export manufacturing and perhaps a start, uh, sort of some limited growth in domestic services and the, the start and uh, the beginning of a recovery in international services in 2022 might really be the year of consolidation um, and sort of perhaps a, a chance to refocus on the structural measures that drive potential growth uh, and uh, address some of the lasting uh, costs and legacies of the pandemic in 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Richard. Uh, listening to you, I feel like um, we now have the world economy uh, inflicted by COVID-19, COVID causing a big wound, a very deep one, with a long time for healing and leaving us with a big scar. But uh, for discussion, I think that uh, we should concentrate on how to manage these so-called uncertainties as uh, uh, explained to us by Vangelis. I like very much the uh, issue, the, the recommendations, suggestions about uh, making use of the regional mechanism to minimize or mitigate uh, risk or uncertainty that we'll be facing for uh, the year 2021. As we all know, uh, we, this year, first we had the demand collapse, first quarter, second quarter. Then from the, the third quarter, we had a supply collapse with a lot of idle capacity. And uh, in the quarter four, there was some recovery, my recovery, but with logistic, the global supply chain crisis. None of you mentioned this, but uh, just to inform you, now the freight, shipping rate, you know, air freight and, and sea freight, high as ever. So very difficult, you know, uh, for uh, enterprises to uh, export and, and to trade. And because of that, now we have this looming financial crisis, particularly for small and medium and even large enterprises. This, you know, uh, explain why uh, we are entering into the year of 2021 with a lot of uncertainty. And as you all know very well, risk, when you can measure, you can manage. But uncertainty is very difficult to, <laughs> to measure and therefore to manage. But, but uh, it's, we can rely on some of the uh, regional mechanisms that we have. I think um, Vangelis told us about CPTPP, uh, ASEF, EPEC and so on. So I'd like to uh, open the floor for discussion. Uh, anyone who would like to talk about this uh, mitigation of risk and mitigation of ma or managing uncertainty, please. We have enough time talking about the wound, you know, <laughs> the problems. But uh, what do we do now? Any, any one? We have about 20 minutes. Yes, anybody hands up? I do not see any hand. Uh, you can you can show or you can you can uh, uh, say that you like to speak. Just let me know. This. Dr. Narangchai, we have a question from the Q and A tab. Ah, Calvin, Calvin, Jay, please. Yeah. Please go ahead. You can manage the Q Q A. You're managing the Q A, please, uh, Calvin. Um, in in the Q and A tab, uh, we have one question from Zarab Khan asking uh, what will be the downside risks of the significant debt taken by countries in the Pacific and how can they balance debt servicing while also trying to stimulate economic growth and recovery? So I think this is a more open question maybe for both um, speakers. Uh, any one of you, Vangelis uh, or Richard, would you like to respond? Okay, maybe I can <laughs> have, a, have a go first. Um, so, yes, I mean, it's a good question. And I mean, there, there's no clear answer, to be honest. I mean, the challenge is, you know, how do countries 
balance the offset, the need to spend today versus the potential need to spend tomorrow. Um, so you know, if you avoid spending today and you see households and firms experience significant economic harm, higher unemployment, loss of earnings, sort of bankruptcies, and that creates not just short-term pain, but also long-term sort of pain in, in terms of uh, you know, the ability to bounce back and recover. Of course, if, we, if, if governments spend heavily today uh, and deplete all of their fiscal space uh, to sort of mitigate the impact of the shock, then it's very hard to invest in, in supporting growth beyond. And the challenge, of course, is that you know, regardless of which strategy is taken, governments are exiting this crisis. You know, they're seeing slower growth, weaker revenue collection, higher public spending, the inevitable consequence of counter-cyclical fiscal policy, then debt is rising. In fact, in Malaysia, we expect to see, you know, um, I think, the additional four percentage points of GDP spent on debt service over the, over the medium term um, after the crisis. So this is a very real challenge. I think for the lowest income economies, there's perhaps some greater space. I know many ec economies in the Pacific have been uh, subject to the, the debt service suspension initiative, uh, the G20, supported by the World Bank and IMF, essentially allows those economies for the whole of 2020 to suspend all debt service. I think there's hope that that will be expended into 2021. Reality, of course, for low income and least developed economies, it's not just about suspending debt service. I think there's a very real need to actually look at um, debt resolution and sort of net present value changes to the, the debt stock that the, the lowest income economies uh, are carrying on their public sector balance sheets. I think one of the lessons we do know from past crises is that, you know, if you just sort of kick debt service into the future, um, you know, economies, like small economies that go into a shock will take an awfully long time to, to bounce back. Um, so I think a mixture of sort of public policies to weigh off those trade, those trade offs, look at ways to sort of rebuild fiscal space on the consolidate expenditure, look at new sources of revenue, as well as public uh, international multilateral support uh, towards debt, debt servicing. Thank you. Just to add to what Richard has said, I think the response would vary from country to country, depending upon how much the reserve or the liquidity the country has. You take, for example, Thailand, we are fortunate that we have a lot of reserve and, and liquidity so government can borrow a lot from domestic sources. You know, the next round, um, we thought it would be over by the end of the year, but it looks like it's going to go on. So we have to go into another scheme of borrowing and, and financial assistance. But not every country can do that depending upon what they have. You know? So I think it's useful to share among us you know, which country has a reserve, uh, which country has uh, liquidity, which country does not have, which imply ability of government to borrow, imply ability of government to help. And, and, and if there's shortage, perhaps we can help each other across country. And maybe the World Bank can do the statistic, you know, about the health, financial health of each country in Asia Pacific, in APEC. We would like to... Vangelis, you'd like to say something about that? Because that's the challenge for 2021, you know. <laughs> uh, yes. So, so, I mean, I'll only make a brief comment. Um, I don't have much to add to what I thought was a thoughtful response from Richard, other than to say um, we are hoping that finance ministers in the APEC context will have a chance to talk about some of this, because it is the big press. And then that's an opportunity to use APEC precisely for what it was designed for, which is to share best practice and some knowledge about some lessons learned there and to kind of think through each of them, what they heard from their colleagues and, um, and hopefully then embed that in their own practice as they, as they go forward. So the role for APEC there, I think, is a, is a, is a positive one, given the breadth and depth of, of the likely crisis and, and the trade-offs that people have to think about. Uh, anyone else? Or uh, we can go to Calvin again for the QA pool. Any more questions in the pool? Sure, uh, Dr. Narjai. Yes. So maybe I'll combine a couple of questions from the Q&A yes. tab about um, current economic conditions and how this affects. Uh, so we have um, a question on whether the panelists think that APAC will continue to remain a major driver of global economic growth and uh, digital economy in a time of uncertainty. And um, this is a question on uh, how uh, APEC can do for uh, WTO 
reform, what, what, what APEC can do for WTO reform in that sense. Maybe we'll do that first and then we'll cycle back and I get more questions. Yeah, that's on my mind too, you know, how much APEC can do. Uh, and with the new administration in, in the U.S., perhaps uh, we can hope a little bit more about APEC or not, I don't know. Uh, Vangelis, do you like to respond to that? I think because 2021, New Zealand is the chair, so they would have to uh, make some assessment about what APEC can do, and particularly in relation also to WTO. You know, I'm still hoping that eventually we'll go back to WTO <laughs> eventually. But Vangelis, do you like to please? Yeah, look, um, I, so I'm, I'm a big believer that APEC does have a role to play um, in supporting the, the WTO. And I do think a key role it can play next year is the, the confidence building role that it can provide. So it is a, if you like, a safe space for economies to come together and talk about, you know, some of the big trade policy questions. And I mean, in my opening introduction, I gave an example of something that APEC could concretely do, which is identify COVID-19 essential goods, PPE equipment, which medicines, how does it help vaccines, and then also services. And that would then feed into, there will be a WTO trade and health initiative, but APEC then has a chance to help shape that um, through the views of its own economies. And then of course, APEC has a vital function in terms of an op opportunity for the 21 of us to think about, you know, um, where are we all at on the customs moratorium um, for, uh, for digital trade? Uh, what would we, what, what do each of us think are the big questions around um, data localization, for example, or how we think about the relationship between that and, and a market access question, or very practical things like, you know, electronic certification, electronic si signature recognition, where we might be able to do something within APEC individually. In other words, using APEC strength, which is as an incubator, as a confidence building measure, and as a safe space. And look, if the if the incoming administration wants to do something um, uh, about you know building confidence in the region, APEC provides the perfect vehicle for that. It doesn't, you know, it is not Geneva. It is not a free trade agreement. Um, it is actually about working together and sharing um, sharing what we're learning. And I think it has a there's a tremendous opportunity there for APEC. And we should not forget that APEC has played a vital role in its history at various crucial moments launching the Doha round, for example, some of the interventions of APEC just before that, in the two years before that, on, for example, fishery subsidies, on anti-dumping, um, were really important ways of driving the agenda uh, in Geneva, but in a, you know, a consensus and a voluntary um, uh, way. Perhaps uh, we should hear from somebody from the US about uh, whether the new administration uh, would help uh, make APEC more effective with the appointment of Catherine Tai and all that. Uh, anybody want to comment? Do we have uh, US PEC participating? Anyone? No, no. Maybe uh, Donald can comment on behalf of the US. <laughs> Donald, you like to say something about your views? Uh, what do you think that the Biden administration would, uh, would uh, come back and make use of APEC for a lot of things that they initially wanted to do? No? Your, your microphone is muted, uh, don't know. I yes, can't Donna? speak, I, can't, I obviously cannot speak on behalf of the uh, United States, but of course I have a very uh, close uh, vantage point and I have fairly, uh, uh, strong, if not informed, views on that uh, set of issues. Uh, certainly, I think that the, uh, the Biden administration uh, is committed, uh, it's certainly committed to uh, more cooperation with other countries. It's committed to uh, the multilateral trade system in a way that it has, uh, that it has not been during the uh, last four years. Um, my sense is that, is that there will be another review of uh, its policy towards Asia. Of course, China figures very uh, prominently in that, and I don't see any particular change in the near uh, term. Uh, but I think uh, having lived through the last four years in the APEC uh, context of the uh, Trump administration, uh, 
that almost anything would be uh, would be more positive uh, from uh, certainly from a Canadian point of view, but I think also from a uh, uh, from an APEC uh, uh, point of view. I don't want to say that all is going to be uh, you know uh, rosy in any way, shape, or form, but my expectation is that in keeping with more engagement uh, internationally, uh, that, that, that that APEC. Uh, uh, U.S. involvement in APEC will be uh, will be uh, there will be more engagement and in a better way than we have uh, we've seen in the past. I, I don't think that we should expect uh, immediate uh, changes or results because I think that the Biden administration is going to be uh, challenged by and uh, devote a great deal of its attention in the uh, in the early part of its mandate to. Uh, uh, national domestic sets of issues, um, but uh, inevitably uh, international uh, issues and foreign policy issues have a habit of uh, forcing themselves upon the uh, upon the uh, uh, the agenda, and that will happen over time. Thank you, Don. Oh, thank you, uh, Kevin. Any more? We have about five minutes more. Yes, anyone wants to speak? Yeah, I think we have a hand uh, raised from, uh, from um, Dr. Hamida Yusuf. Yes, please. Are you on the screen? Hmm. There may be some technical difficulties. Let's just cycle back to um, the Q&A tab again. Um, I have um, some questions on um, what role can trade policy, including RCEP and CPTPP, play in addressing the likely widening inequalities? Um, so this includes the distributional impacts of the pandemic uh, in, in societies. So um, this question elaborates. People like to talk about digital provisions, but without good dispute resolution provisions on this, um, for example, RCEP, Michelle, on this front, what role can these play? And maybe I'll take another question and then we can do uh, two questions at once since it's a um, little time left. Uh, and other people, in addition to evangelists, can also join, you know, because we have a lot of experts on CPTPP and ASEP. You, you're going to say something else, uh, Calvin? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, should we do another question? So um, I have another question here. Um, considering the pandemic-related challenges to economic growth, what should governments be doing at this point? Uh, so do we know what works and perhaps more importantly, what doesn't work in terms of uh, economic measures? Mm. Okay, so first about this uh, CPTPP and RCEP that uh, I think Vangeli is very optimistic that uh, we can activate many of the measures in there. You'd like to respond to that? And then the second is about uh, what else government can do at this time. First, so, Angelis, do you like to respond, please? Yeah, sure. Just maybe a brief comment on CPTPP, CPTPP and, and RCEP, because I know you are picking that up separately. I mean, I think that th there are two important things, I think, to, to note. RCEP, yes, um, it is easy to be critical of RCEP because it's missing, you know, some hard rules obligations in the, in the digital space. But I think it's important to see it as it's a way of building confidence in the, in the system. And I think that is an important part that, that RCEP has really done, which is, you know, this is an international treaty. It does have enforceable obligations. It brings in a number of largest FTA in the world. Um, for that to happen at this precise moment is a really important confidence building measure. And then there's the classical benefits um, uh, that trade, trade can deliver, you know, in terms of the way in which it drives growth, innovation, productivity. You know, I always say in the New Zealand context that if you're an exporter, you pay better wages, um, you are more productive, uh, you are more innovative, um, and you employ more people. Um, and that, that's, a, that's the core classical kind of argument around uh, trade agreements. Now, in terms of CBTP, of course, th there are, of course, harder and clearer obligations. And that's sort of the next step, I think, um, to ensure that, you know, small firms, for example, can be confident uh, that the hard rules out there are going to protect their position and protect their, you know, that an electronic certificate will indeed be recognised at the other end, as indeed would a electronic signature. Just very quickly on the how would uh, governments um, 
uh, you know, respond to the, to the crisis? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that they should not do. Um, and one of those most obviously is protectionism. Um, and I think that, you know, that's the one thing we learned from the Great Depression, not that the Great Depression was caused by protectionism, but by that protectionism made the, the recovery slower and it took longer. Indeed, it made the depression deeper uh, and wider. And that's one thing we really do need to guard against is um, the temptation to draw the conclusion that actually the best thing to do now would be to close uh, my market. Um, so I think there were some very important initiatives there. The APEC uh, declaration last year, which clearly sent a message against uh, protectionism. And then there was the, um, the New Zealand, Singapore led um, declaration, which, you know, countries like Canada and Australia and others were participants in, which sent a very clear message from our region that protectionism is not the answer to uh, a crisis. In other words, in an international crisis, what you need is more international cooperation, not less. Thank you. Actually, I honestly believe, you know, that uh, CPTPP and ASEP have a lot of mechanism that we can utilize to mitigate uh, risks and problems. Uh, the, I think we should go back and revisit and study uh, these two agreements very carefully. I think the last few years, because of trade conflicts and tension, people, I think, have forgotten a lot of details <laughs> that we have spent so many years uh, negotiating you know, and agreeing, officially agreeing to what to do. So I really like very much what Vangelis has suggested, you know, that we should use it. I think we, we don't have time now. Uh, I'd like to come to the conclusion that we all realize we are in serious problem. We are about to get out of it, but, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be <laughs> so soon. So we, we have to really pay attention to how to really restore the global supply chain as soon as possible. And CPTPP and ASEP may allow us to do some of these things. In fact, uh, for some of you who may not be in business, uh, the more serious is about air freight and sea freight. Mm. The shipping cost is so high, you know, and I like very much what uh, Minister Miti uh, Malaysia suggested, that we should streamline processes, the, the freight, freight uh, market mechanism, you know, because of no, no shipping and therefore it's very, very expensive to, to ship, to export and to import these days. So streamlining processes, which are mainly about regulation, which very much in the uh, CBTPP and, and ASEP agreement and supported uh, by, by APEC in terms of policy support. We should do that. And we must maintain financial health of all enterprises. I know that each country uh, has different ability to maintain financial enterprises, health of financial enterprises, but if you could help, you could help, you know, maybe we could borrow cross country, you know, uh, to, to help uh, the enterprises. And with that, uh, we can uh, go on to the structural reform. Uh, next year, we can spend time working on structural reform. And those will be the way that we, we should you know, agree to in order to keep our epic economy going together. Now, with this, uh, I have run out of my time uh, for this session uh, for one hour. I'd like very much to thank Vangelis and Richard for you know, spending the time sharing with us their views, their ideas. Thank you for the participation. And now, uh, turn the session back to the chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Narongchai and panelists for the insightful conversation. Before we move things along, may I please request the moderator, co-moderator and esteemed panelists of Plenary Session 1 to switch on their videos for us to take a group photo. Thank you. Sorry, you want us to switch off the video? I think right? the panelists for session one should switch yes. off the video. Everyone else, please switch off your video. Thank you. Oh, switch so on. Okay. okay. Now it's on. Mine is on now. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. All right, let's give it a few seconds while the technical team takes the screenshot. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. To move things right. along with today's proceedings, may I now please have the pleasure of inviting Associate Professor Dr. Andrew Kamjai to moderate plenary session two 
initial assessment of the CPTPP and future of RCEP, how are member economies faring to date, especially in times of COVID-19? Associate Professor Andrew, the floor is yours. A very good morning, everyone. Thank you, ISIS, for this important and timely session. Uh, I'm picking up what Dr. Narunchai is asking for, you ask and you will get, which is to form a discussion on RCEP and CPPP, which is what this session is all about. Since the global financial crisis, the number of trade limiting measures implemented by G20 countries has more than quadrupled, covering about 5% of world imports in 2015. A movement against globalization seems to be in fashion, whereby it challenges the core principles of free trade, movement of people, foreign investment, and multilateralism. In 2020, the emergence of the coronavirus pandemic has worsened this trade, which is why I think the signing of RCEP is such a welcoming news. It gives a much needed boost for a robust recovery for businesses and people in our region, particularly during the current crisis. The deal to improve market access with tariff and quotas eliminated over 65% of goods traded and make business predictable with common rules of origin. I think uh, these are some of the important key salient features of the RCEP. This will encourage firms to invest more in the region, including building supply chains and services and generate jobs. On the other hand, another mega trade agreement in the pipeline is the CPTPP. The progress of the trade agreement is exciting with reports that China is actively considering of joining the, this trade agreement. Japan even went further by announcing its aspiration to form the FTAAP. So um, free trade suddenly became a lively topic. Not sure, maybe because everyone is feeling the brunt of COVID and need an avenue to ensure their economic security through stronger trade and economic integration. Here with us today are experts who will be giving an initial assessment on the CPTPP and the future of RCEP. Uh, how are members faring economics, economies fair during this time of COVID-19? I think I will just give a brief introduction to all speakers to get all the formalities out of the way. First speaker is Dr. Vo Trin Tran from the National Financial and Monetary Policy Advisory Council. Uh, he is currently senior expert of the Central Institute of Economic Management. Dr. Vo mainly undertakes research and provides consultation on issues related to trade liberalization and international economic integration, as well as macroeconomic policy. Second, we have Dr. Kiko Verico, the advisor of the Minister of Finance, Industry and International Trade Division, Indonesia. Dr. Verico is the Deputy Director of the Institute of Economic and Social Research, Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia. Since 2020, he has served as an industry and international trade advisor to the finance minister of the Republic of Indonesia. He is also an author of the book, The Future of ASEAN Economic Integration. Also with us here today is Dr. Jayam Menon, visiting senior fellow, ICS, Yusuf Ishak Institute. Uh, Dr. J, uh, Jayam Menon is a lead economist so he was the lead economist in the office of the chief economist in the ADB. I'm a fan of his work. He has authored and edited almost more than 15 books, 40 chapters, and 80 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Our final speaker is Mr. Barney Riley. He's the lead negotiator, trade and economic group, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. But Mr. Barney has a legal background and practiced commercial law for six years before joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he's currently a lead negotiator <clears throat> in the Ministry uh, Trade and Economic Group responsible for New Zealand's trade negotiations with China as well as the RCEP. Well, with all the introductions aside, from now on, I will play the role of a glorified timekeeper each speaker will be given 10 minutes to speak and I will verbally indicate the remaining three minutes of the discussion so that the time will be in track. I will also, note, I will also like to note that uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So all the participants, please feel free to use the chat features. 
So uh, without further ado, I will start the discussion with uh, Dr. Vo. Please, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, good morning from Vietnam to everyone. Uh, I am very pleased uh, to share my uh, some views on the uh, Vietnam integration and the impact. Next, I have some slide to show you. Uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Vu, give us a second. We are trying to get the slide. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, I have four, uh, four points. Yeah, Dr. Vu, uh, you can switch on your slides now, actually. Not yet? Sorry, sorry, just no. Okay. Now, can you see my slide? Yes, really. Okay. Dr. Bo. Next, next, next. Yeah. Okay. So basically, I have a four point. Uh, something about the Doi Mai renovation reform in Vietnam and uh, process of integration. And then I look at the impact of the economic integration and some recent observation, uh, particularly in, in terms of implementation of the CPTPP and uh, EVFTA, Vietnam uh, European uh, FTA, in the context of uh, uncertainty. And finally, I, ha I have uh, some concluding remarks. Okay, uh, basically, uh, Economic reform in Vietnam rely on three pillars, right? Macro stabilization, market reform, and uh, international integration. And basically, ideas behind that pillars is that we try to enlarge uh, set of the choice by the people. So it, people basically can do everything, right? Uh, particularly for the doing business. Uh, so integration very crucial point of the uh, Doi Moi of the uh, reform in Vietnam. And uh, in principle, foundation for integration in Vietnam, uh, we have about uh, two or three points. That's basically continuous process, right? And uh, become more comprehensive over time. Uh, since uh, from the ASEAN membership, uh, 1995, APEC, 1998, uh, U.S. Vietnam BTA in the year 2000, WTO uh, 2007, and many other FTAs, right? So more, more comprehensive one. Uh, second point, since uh, the year 2013, the scope of integration in Vietnam, not just uh, economic one, but cover all the areas, right? Uh, diplomatic, uh, political, uh, security, but economic integration continue to be the, the most in the center of integration. And Vietnam also try to uh, balance relation with the own partners in the world. And we also now uh, try to be very proactive and a responsive member on the, of, on the international institution. So uh, we very respect and support a multilateral framework like the UN, WTO, APEC, ASEAN. Uh, and for ASEAN, uh, uh, basically we think about three big C, community, cooperation, and uh, centrality. Right? And uh, if we look at the FDAs in Vietnam, so the most member, they are also our comprehensive or strategic comprehensive partnership of Vietnam. So basic idea is that we, uh, we cooperate uh, with the major country based on the rule-based FDIs, but at the same time, we also uh, pay attention on the cooperation. Right? And uh, basically, that's a foundation for integration in Vietnam. But uh, in the world of uncertainty, we also very responsive uh, to the changes. Okay, that's uh, some of the latest. Uh, information about the FDI we saw. Now we have the 18 FDIs, uh, including high quality like the TPP, CPTP, and EV FDA. And uh, not just ASEP, I don't know, a few days ago, uh, we signed the conclusion of negotiation with the UK. So now we have a Vietnam-UK FDI. So that's also maybe the first step for the UK, uh, you know, uh, 
to look at the uh, possibility to join the uh, CPTPP. And uh, that's a figure of choice uh, uh, between Vietnam and other major uh, partner. You see, again, on the partner, uh, the key investor, the key uh, trade, uh, trading partner, they, they also in uh, a member of the FTAs with the Vietnam. What's about impact? Uh, so far, we have a lot of quantitative uh, study on the impact of the Vietnam economy, particularly in terms of the GDP, economic growth, and export. Uh, interestingly, uh, ASEP is the biggest FTA, right, beside. But if you look at the impact, uh, uh, the biggest one, that's a TPP. And uh, following, that's the EVFDA and then ASEP. Uh, EVFDA and the CPTPP and ASEP, right? That, the reason very simple, we already have uh, ASEAN plus one FDA, so ASEP in terms of export and the GDP uh, growth, is yeah, not so significant impact, even positive one, like uh, CPTPP, EVFDA, and uh, particularly TPP. Next. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, 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 that's not about just export expansion or trade expansion, but there's uh, also the new uh, space, new room uh, for the business community. They, they can take advantage uh, to do many other economic activities. Another thing very important for Vietnam is that Vietnam uh, now can be seen as a hub for investment, right? And uh, uh, with the high quality FDI, that's where in compliance with our strategy. And last year for the first time, uh, we have the new uh, policy in attracting FDI. Uh, basically idea is that we, uh, we try to not maximize the volume of FDI the money, right? But uh, we focus more on the quality of FBI in terms of technology, you know, environmental uh, friendly FBI in terms of technology and skin uh, transfer and, you know, and the linkage with the uh, local firms, especially uh, backward and forward linkage with the SME. And uh, maybe the most important thing, uh, we think about the FTAs as a kind of pressure or catalyst for the domestic reform, uh, especially for the institutional reform, right? Uh, and uh, last but not least, particularly in, uh, in the environment of uncertainty, right? A lot of the high uh, risks. Uh, we see the FDA and cooperation with many uh, partners as the way we can diversify the market and minimize uh, mitigate the risk. Next. Of course, integration is uh, not everything. There's also about the cost and the risk. Uh, the cost of adjustment cost, the cost of compliance with the rule based FDA or WTO also maybe sometimes high. Uh, macro instability and uh, many kind, uh, maybe economy, uh, economy become more vulnerable to any kind of shock like uh, COVID 19, you know financial crisis. And most important, you have to remember, trade liberalization uh, maybe push you into the so-called trade liberalization trap or low cost labor trap, right? If you cannot, uh, you know, move up uh, the value chain, if you can create higher value added along the supply chain, along the value chain, right? Next is, now, uh, my uh, third uh, point, there's uh, some observation, uh, particularly over the last two years, right? When you see the uh, trade war, uh, trade conflict between the US and China, and uh, uh, this year, right, uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, very negative impact on, on uh, economies. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, institutional uh, 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 reform. And a lot of uh, things we already have done so far for the improve, uh, improvement of the legal framework, you know, from the law of enterprise, law of investment, law of public investment, law of government uh, procurement, law of public-private partnership, uh, IPR, and the Code of Labor. 
And that's not on. We also have since the year 2014 and 15, uh, we look at the indicators developed by the World Bank, and we try to catch up with the most, uh, the best uh, practice uh, implemented by other ASEAN, like the Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, in terms of how we can improve the business environment. And if you look at the indicators by the World Bank over the last uh, five or six years, uh, Vietnam quite have substantial improvement in, in that uh, 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 direction. Now look at the CPTPP. We, we, uh, since uh, uh, the January last year, we are, uh, also follow up uh, after the uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conclusion of uh, CPTPP. Uh, and uh, we uh, have done everything to comply with the CPTPP and that uh, process continue on. Next. And uh, that's- So uh, you have one minute. You have one okay, minute. Okay, foreign investment uh, increase uh, quite, uh, quite, 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 uh, quite significant in the year 2019 and even in the year 2000, somehow declined, uh, but not as in many other country and right now uh, more than 100 ENC, they are interested in possibility of investment in uh, Vietnam like this. And try also, right, you see uh, quite positive growth in the year 2019 and uh, even for the first nine months this year, we have also positive growth in both trade, uh, export plus import and export. And uh, for those country in the CPTPP, uh, uh, we don't have FDA like Canada and Mexico uh, growth of export quite, uh, quite significant increase over the last two years, right? And over the last uh, three months when uh, EVFDA uh, become effective, uh, uh, EVFDA also have very quite positive impact on the uh, economic growth in Vietnam. Even for the first six months, we have negative impact, uh, COVID-19 negative impact on the uh, export to the EU uh, negative growth. But over the last three months, you can see uh, positive growth uh, export from Vietnam to the EU, right? Nice. Okay, so that's a reason behind uh, why we can have the uh, GDP growth, even the lowest over the last 35 years of reform in Vietnam, but why, you know, a good one in the uh, dark side of the global economy uh, number one, that's, uh, we already controlled quite successfully uh, COVID-19, and we think that's the most in, uh, important factor. And the second, we have also other, like many uh, other countries, we have policy supporting the business. We uh, have many measures, social measures, monetary, fiscal uh, measures to support uh, the enterprise. Uh, and uh, uh, last but not least, there's uh, Together with uh, focus on the uh, domestic market, we also take advantage of deeper and wider integration like uh, uh, already I mentioned, CPTPP and EVFDI, right? Okay, next. And that's a uh, concluding remark, right? We uh, already I mentioned proactive responsive member of uh, international community. We uh, support the rule-based open and fair and transparent uh, integration. And uh, we see ASEAN vision beyond 2025, APEC vision, uh, 2040, and open regionalism. Uh, again, that's uh, about the, 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 the crucial role of ASEAN and Asia Pacific as a leading uh, reason for the integration and global recovery post COVID 19. And uh, CPTPP, TPP, ASEAN, they are more complementary rather than contract. Uh, three and they are important step total what the free trade area for the whole region of course in the long run and uh, Thai now is very important for Vietnam and we see the interaction very close uh, between domestic reform, institutional reform and international integration and Vietnam also means uh, business that's the hub for investment and doing this we need a developed local firm we need high quality FDI I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Vo. Glad to know that economic integration is a continuous process uh, in Vietnam. And Vietnam has actually broadened the scope of their integration to include the IR dimension. 
and also taking a bigger role as a hub for investment, I mean, across uh, the region. And the impact of FDA, it seems as if asset has lesser significance, which we have rightly pointed out more, most probably because we already have most of the uh, agreements within the countries of ASEP. And uh, it's good to also know that Vietnam is moving up the value chain, just like Malaysia, looking for higher quality of FDI. The aspiration of moving up the value chain, I think, is in the mind of so many, how to say, uh, Asian countries. Um, I, I would like to invite our second speaker, Dr. Kiki, uh, in interest of time, I think um, we can... Yes, okay, uh, Dr. Kiki, uh, the, the session is yours now. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Professor Andrew, for your kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for uh, inviting me, distinguished speakers, uh, panelists, and participants. Uh, please, uh, the committee, allow me to share the screen. Okay. <clears throat> I think it's easier for me to explain uh, my thoughts uh, with these uh, slides. So uh, let me start uh, first slide. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, the on the TPP and uh, CP, uh, CPTPP and the RCEP uh, from the perspectives of uh, uh, Indonesia and the perspective of ASEAN. Uh, I have uh, seven points, actually six points, and then uh, the last is conclusion. Uh, for these six points, uh, actually, I divide into uh, two big points. The first big points consists of three sub points, which is uh, uh, which are colorful economic levels for both uh, mega regionalism uh, organization and then uh, perspective of ASEAN uh, to looking at this uh, from uh, the ASEAN centrality and ASEAN way uh, uh, principle, and then uh, Indonesia perspective for sure uh, from my base uh, to looking at the mega regional closeness uh, comparing between these two. And the second big point, uh, more about quantitative uh, analysis, uh, the comparisons uh, from macroeconomics, productivity, and uh, impact simulation that I use, uh, apply uh, GTEP model to see the short run and long run uh, for both uh, region uh, impact. And then the conclusion. Okay, let me start with the first uh, <coughs> uh, slide. Uh, which I mentioned colorful. So both uh, CPTPP and the RCP uh, are having uh, colorful, uh, meaning that a various level of economics uh, in terms of, for instance, participations based on OECD data that uh, they have uh, forward, backward linkage, for instance, uh, high, uh, medium, and low, uh, very various. And uh, also, if you look at from uh, simple indicators like income per capita, if you compare, uh, I found uh, 865 formation uh, in, in, in classifications of all the member states, RCP and the uh, CPTPP, uh, by high income country, uh, upper middle, and lower middle. So, uh, eight high income country, six upper middle income country, and five lower middle income country, uh, they are member uh, states of uh, CPTPP and the RCEP. And then I compare uh, only one out of eight high income country that not part of uh, uh, CPTPP, which is South Korea, and only one of uh, lower middle income country that are not, uh, not part of uh, uh, or, or part of uh, CPTPP, which is uh, Vietnam. So uh, CPTPP is more biased to high income member states, while uh, RCEP is more biased to lower middle income member state because for the upper middle uh, six member states uh, they are equal uh, they are even between uh, member states of CPTPP and member state of uh, RCEP and CPTPP. So uh, what I conclude in these uh, figures is like uh, is more uh, high income level uh, member states uh, in the CPTPP uh, and in the opposite in the RCEP for the lower middle. And then from the uh, perspectives, uh, that's uh, finding number one. Finding number two from the perspective, of course, as we all know that uh, the RCEP uh, consists of all the member states of ASEAN, 10 of them. Uh, so more on the ASEAN uh, and then carry the ASEAN centrality and more and on the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN way, while in the, uh, in the uh, uh, CPTPP, 
uh, consists of only some of the ASEAN member states. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, more far than the uh, ASEAN centrality uh, uh, principle. <laughs> and then from Indonesia perspectives, uh, if I uh, calculate the weighted uh, composite index model, uh, I found uh, this model and then I, I tried to calculate uh, for the RCP and CPTPP and I found that all the member states of the uh, RCP are the Indonesian dominant uh, 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 economic partners compared to uh, the CPTPP, especially in North America and Latin America like Chile, Peru, uh, Mexico and Canada. Uh, so more Indonesia is a more, uh, how to call it, integrated to the RCEP at this level. And then I try to compare from macroeconomic indicators uh, countries that uh, member states of uh, CPTPP and countries that uh, uh, only member state of the RCEP. And then I divide into five to five countries so I can see the uh, control, uh, control uh, countries and then uh, observe countries. And inside the um, rectangle or inside the square, you can see that more volatile than uh, outside uh, or left uh, 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 right hand side of the of the figures. That you can see that uh, it 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 confirms that uh, CPTPP is more uh, divergence in terms of uh, macroeconomic indicators. Uh, I think. Uh, agriculture sector, manufacture sector, service sector, and GDP size and GDP per capita uh, compared to only uh, RCP member state. So again, uh, uh, by, by saying that uh, bias on high income country and then more for, uh, uh, divergence, uh, we can see that uh, it's um, more fluid in the, in the CPTPP and more uh, convergent uh, to my, to my uh, understanding for the RCP. <clears throat> And uh, I'd like to do more uh, further uh, analysis on this uh, two mega regionalism by comparing my own calculation on uh, using the RCA and CMSA3 and classify into the grid, sunrise, sunset, and suffer industry. And I found uh, like this landscape. And from this landscape, I calculate the CPTPP have 0 0.17 uh, integration level, while the uh, RCP 0 0.08. Uh, Integration meaning uh, convergent or divergent, and uh, the more close to zero, the more convergent, the more uh, above zero, the more uh, divergent. So uh, CPTPP with 0 0.17 more divergent than RCEP. So it again uh, confirm uh, that the RCEP is a more, uh, how to call it, a more convergent, um, more into uh, uh, economic uh, uh, convergency, uh, and then from the sunrise and sunset uh, relations to as a proxy for uh, investment, uh, I found that CPP, CPTPP is uh, on higher uh, level than the RCEP. Uh, CPTPP, I, ca I calculate 1.4, RCEP 1.04. What, what does it mean? It means that uh, CPTPP has more strong uh, investment relations if, if they apply. Uh, than the RCEP. So in terms of this from uh, free flows of trade to move to free flows of investment from intra-trade to intra-investment, uh, CPTPP is uh, faster than the RCEP. Uh, again, because the RCEP uh, is a more on the uh, convergent but biased to uh, lower middle income uh, member states. So, but again, uh, if because uh, the, 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 the indicator is uh, above one, uh, RCEP still have a potential to trade and investment relations. Uh, uh, then this uh, again can uh, we can see that uh, the RCEP can be like uh, uh, independent uh, regional economic uh, organizations uh, in terms of uh, uh, trade and investment. So both available. And last but not least, I simulate GTEP model and I use uh, short run uh, 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 indicators of trade balance and then uh, long run indicators of uh, uh, price of supply. And the price of supply is uh, inverse of uh, productivity. So the higher productivity, the lower uh, uh, price of supply. And I found both for CP CPTPP and, uh, and, and uh, RCEP uh, uh, for the trade balance uh, negative, which means uh, this, is, this is the cost of integration, while for the price of supply uh, negative, which is uh, good, meaning that improvement of uh, productivity because uh, it's uh, inverse of the productivity indicator. So what I 
uh, can say from the uh, simulation CPTPP and the uh, RCEP is um, the cost coming immediate, but the benefit comes after, takes time. So both uh, organizations ask for uh, 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 the, the member state to ask the member state to uh, struggle for uh, the integrations because in the short run there will be a shock in the trade balance but in the long run it, it will increase the productivity so both organizations uh, I, I, I see no difference uh, they provide but maybe the, the, the period will be uh, like a different uh, path uh, so my conclusion is uh, again number one uh, they are colorful members uh, both organizations uh, uh, RCP carries more open regionalism principle that fits with the ASEAN way uh, both can have a uh, trade and investment relations, the RCP, uh, more uh, Indonesian dominant um, uh, uh, trading partners, uh, RCP economic integration is more convergent than the CP CPTPP, and the RCP can have uh, also trade and investment capacity. Uh, but the RCP, uh, to my understanding, uh, will be uh, slower because it, it's more a soft mega regionalism than the CPTPP that uh, more on hard regionalism. So uh, CPTPP needs uh, strong leaders, uh, strong country leaders to, to push the more than trade investment uh, agenda like uh, uh, human capital, uh, productivity, environment, uh, reform, uh, state-owned enterprise uh, roles, and so on. Uh, which fit with the CPTPP, CPTPP characters, but it needs more uh, effort on this on this issue. Without strong uh, uh, members, uh, countries to to lead this uh, CPTPP, I think the slower uh, RCEP will pass uh, can can be uh, uh, more advanced than the, the CPTPP. We, we, we don't know. So again, uh, trade creations comes immediately, investment creation comes after. So uh, both um, uh, country members, uh, mega regional member state has to be patient to achieve the benefit in the long run. But uh, if you put a long run perspective, it's good uh, for both uh, to join to both countries. So uh, Indonesia uh, see uh, CPTP also as a potential. Uh, I think also India see uh, RCEP as a potential. But uh, from my calculation, I found that the pressure to India to RCP is more than Indonesia to CPTPP because uh, the impact is a, a lo a low to Indonesia, CPTPP to Indonesia, then RCP to India. I stop in here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiki, for uh, the, the interesting, uh, how do you say, finding on how CPTPP is biased towards high income country while passed to lower middle income. Uh, you have given a wonderful snapshot on what. Indonesia and how it is how the country is being positioned and uh, maybe we would like to know later how all these snapshots come into play for Indonesia for example Indonesia being closer to members of uh, within ASEP one question later may be you know how will Indonesia capitalize on this information uh, we put a question mark there okay and uh, it is interesting to know that both CBTPP and ASEP uh, will increase the productivity of country but of course, you know, like you mentioned just now, there's a gestation period where, you know, there's some cost uh, that will be involved in short run. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Jan Menon. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And um, while I share my screen, uh, let me start by thanking the organizers, uh, ISIS Malaysia and PEC uh, for having me here today. So um, I've listened carefully and enjoyed the previous presentations. I think you can see my screen. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is uh, try and build on some of the issues uh, my panelists have already raised. Uh, and also in the first session uh, with Dr. Narong Cha and the panelists there. Um, okay, so I think the first, uh, what I'd like to do very quickly is uh, compare CPTPP a little bit with RCEP, even though they're very different agreements. I think we know that. Uh, but then try and say a little bit about one area, which is the opening of borders uh, to services and travel and the role that these types of agreements might be able to play uh, since they've done so well in keeping borders open to goods um, during this pandemic. The next challenge, I think, before the benefits of uh, the vaccine kick in is to open borders. And then I'll just uh, conclude. But firstly, let me say a bit about <clears throat> the uh, two agreements, uh, the topic of this session. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, so they're very different, the two. Um, 
CPTPP and RCEP, and we should recognize that it's apples and oranges at one level. Um, and, um, but these differences are not as stark because uh, TPP and CPTPP are also quite different. There's been quite a bit of dilution um, in critical areas. In fact, 22 provisions uh, in the original TPP uh, were either suspended or significantly revised. And of course, the most affected uh, chapters are the ones re relating to investment and intellectual property, the ones that the US was most keen to push and you know, the ones that were most controversial. Uh, and I think some of this dilution actually has helped the agreement. It's certainly helped the developing members within it. Uh, although we see quite a few developing members are still yet to ratify a CPTPP. But I think it does uh, reduce a lot of the concerns about, you know, huge transfers from poor countries to the, you know, large pharmaceutical firms, if you like, to, you know, summarize a much more complex issue. Uh, but um, anyway, the differences are not as stark as we often uh, speak of. Uh, but there are uh, things like, you know, uh, digital trade, uh, data transfers, and so on, where we still look to the CPTPP to set the standard. Um, and RCEP maybe over time will try and evolve to meet those standards in areas uh, which are less controversial. But RCEP certainly is better place to support um, supply chains within the region. Uh, this is both in terms of its uh, uh, country coverage, uh, you know, it captures um, uh, all the countries in, uh, uh, in East Asia, uh, Southeast and East Asia, involved in the supply chain production of uh, goods, and uh, also its focus on simplifying rules of origin, um, in sort of promoting regulatory convergence and so on, uh, is focused on supporting these supply chains, more so than I think the CPTPP. But I think both these agreements are welcome um, at a time where, you know, the rules-based trading system uh, is uh, under threat. Uh, and, you know, we've had a proliferation, not of FTAs, uh, that was a concern of the past, now it's FTDs, free trade disagreements, rather than agreements. And uh, these agreements, uh, disagreements have been rising uh, with uh, the tensions of COVID. Um, and in the context of a weakened WTO and a dispute settlement mechanism that's currently in paralysis. So, um, uh, so we welcome these sorts of uh, substitutes or quasi-substitutes in a world where WTO has uh, been weakened. But I think we should note that the CPTPP has been largely missing in action uh, during this COVID pandemic, but so too have a lot of other regional and global uh, organizations. Uh, this is a global problem, and the G7, G20 have been quite uh, weak in their responses, and so have other regional uh, groupings. Um, uh, most of the action has been at the national level with very little coordination or coherence. coherence. Uh, what they have been able to do, I think, is to limit the resort to protectionism uh, during these uncertain times, uh, and borders um, <clears throat> have remained largely open to trade in goods. And this is a good thing. Uh, but the trade in services, especially travel and uh, travel-related services, has been uh, lacking. And I'll come back to that as uh, the second part of my presentation. Um, but I think developing Asia has been less affected by the trade slowdown uh, and that goods trade have been rebounding quite strongly. And we can see that in these charts here. Uh, you can see that the, um, for the um, G3 countries, the red uh, curve in the left panel, the drop in goods trade has been very sharp, um, although rebounding. But the green, uh, which is um, 
uh, developing Asia, the drop has been much smaller um, and uh, the rebound started around May, June. Uh, and this is largely because of um, uh, the fact that global supply chains operate in this region um, and the demand for uh, electronics to do things like what we're doing right now, to do Zoom uh, and so on, so life can go on. And also for health supplies has been quite strong. And a lot of that has been produced in developing Asia, in China and Asia. And we can see here that uh, air cargo has been the most affected uh, and ocean trade has been the least affected, but they've all been affected. Uh, but the rebound has already uh, started around May, where it bottomed out, and hopefully will continue. But that's mostly for goods. Now, for services, and especially for travel, uh, the restrictions that were uh, raised as soon as this pandemic started have not come down. Um, and we can see, especially in Asia Pacific, uh, the red curve on the left panel, uh, they have remained stubbornly high, um, you know, um, and more so than in other regions. But in all regions, travel restrictions have not kept up with uh, other easing of domestic restrictions. And of course, on the right panel, we see the disastrous effects, basically decimating the travel and tourism related sectors. So that's what I want to focus on as one area. There are many areas that um, uh, RCEP and CPTPPT can cover, uh, but this is one area I want to focus on. So I think while it made sense to close borders at the start of the pandemic, you know, almost a year later, why are we still so um, uh, concerned about importing the virus uh, when in fact we find that you know, in many countries, uh, you know, this sort of isolating ourselves is no longer an option. Um, now, domestic restrictions have continued to fall, but um, not and narrowed this gap in this asymmetry in domestic versus border restrictions. Not opening up completely, but a careful calibrated opening which narrows this gap. And this will allow, I think, uh, recovery in, econ in the economies without significantly raising health risks. And all of these agreements, ASEAN, CPTPP, RCEP, and even APEC uh, can play a role, I think, in uh, this effort. Uh, and what they can do uh, is to tr help multilateralize a lot of unilateral and bilateral arrangements. Um, Singapore, for instance, has unilaterally opened uh, uh, air travel passes with many countries in the region uh, without reciprocity. Um, it should, uh, we should try and help create reciprocity in travel bubbles. Um, the first travel bubble with Hong Kong had to be deferred because of uh, 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 you know, a new wave of infections in Hong Kong. Uh, but now, uh, we need to look at uh, new travel bubbles and expanding travel bubbles. One option is to create one between countries in ASEAN that have contained community spread of the virus. Um, we could look at one between Singapore and Vietnam initially, uh, a travel bubble, because the travel pass already exists, and then slowly adding countries that have control community transmission. Uh, you need to mutually recognize arrangements, of course, for this to work, especially quarantine and also other health protocols. Uh, for the other ASEAN countries that haven't been able to uh, control community transmission, they can recognize quarantine in these six countries on a one-way non-reciprocal basis because there are benefits to them in doing so. Um, and I think RCEP, for instance, uh, ASEAN can expand to RCEP, where we have Australia and New Zealand looking at a travel bubble very soon, uh, with Australia already allowing quarantine-free travel from New Zealand, and also bringing in China. 
uh, where they've controlled the uh, transmission quite effectively. So let me conclude as time is up. Um, I think uh, for CP, CPTPP to make an impact, we need more ratifications from original members uh, before we can consider expansion, although uh, expansion will be necessary for it to, uh, I think, uh, really have an impact going forward. Uh, I think uh, it's hard to see the US and China joining CPTPP anytime soon, uh, or an RCEP TPP, uh, uh, TPP union, although this is something we can work towards in the long run, perhaps with uh, under the FTAP umbrella of APEC. Um, this could be a long run objective. Um, the earliest entry into force for RCEP is probably a year away. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, we need to work on um, opening up borders uh, before that. And I think uh, we can do that using these agreements. As I mentioned, they can help narrow differences in the perception of health risks uh, across countries with border openings. Uh, these agreements have done very well in converging uh, perceptions on the benefits of opening to trade. Now the challenge is to opening to services by reducing perceptions of health risks across countries. Um, and uh, to do that, I think uh, we need to harmonize rules within these agreements uh, to encourage these flows. And finally, I think uh, all these types of agreements will have their greatest impact if they remain open and outward looking. And I think this is something that CPTPP and RCEP should do following in the steps of ASEAN that has done it very well. So with that, let me stop there and thank you for your attention. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Dr. Menon. Uh, thank you for reminding us that in our exuberance towards free trade agreement, uh, both agreements uh, are different in, in nature. Uh, one area that I think that you have touched on uh, that is very important and I think uh, we have to actually focus more on that is the regional supply chain or global value chain be it on goods or services such as logistics, air and uh, sea freight. And I also thank uh, Dr. Menon for bringing this up in the context of RCEP. Uh, it will be also interesting to know, let's put a question mark here on how will these two agreements affect services maybe beyond the areas of the travel bubbles. Um, anyway, I'll move to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Arnie Riley. Uh, you can have the floor, please. Thanks very much, Professor Kam. And um, thank you to PEC and to ISIS Malaysia for uh, the opportunity to meet colleagues and uh, discuss this very interesting issue today. I'm going to come at it um, with five um, main points. First, um, just to recall really, um, CPTPP's first year um, of operation and sort of CPTPP uh, in 2019, um, just as a way of setting context um, particularly recalling also New Zealand as the depository for that, um, for that agreement, so I'll try and look at it from that perspective. Second, um, we'll look at CPTPP um, in its second year, 2020, um, and particularly, of course, um, any um, early um, observations we can make regarding CPTPP and um, its contribution to um, you know, the recovery from the COVID economic shock. And then building on that, my third point, we'll just look um, briefly at um, New Zealand's trade recovery strategy from, from COVID. Um, my fourth point, um, we'll look at CPTPP's um, role um, in our trade recovery strategy. And then finally, um, my fifth point, um, we'll look at RCEP um, and um, what, um, you know, what we can say about that um, at this early stage. Uh, in terms of um, the potential impact of RCEP uh, in the region um, and uh, particularly, you know, what New Zealand's um, hope uh, and expectation is regarding um, RCEP and um, our trade recovery. So um, first, uh, CPTPP, um, its first year, um, 2019. 
Um, and just recalling, um, you know, just some basic facts, which we're very familiar to, um, to everybody here. Um, but, you know, we do consider CPTPP a landmark agreement. And, you know, that's for two reasons, at least. Um, one of it's just sheer size. Um, and then secondly, the, the quality of its rules, the, the, the high standards that it's set. Um, in terms of its size, it is, of course, what we call a mega, plural, mega plurilateral agreement, um, uh, encompassing 11 um, economies, uh, which make up 13.5% of, of world GDP, um, including a number of um, G20 economies and, of course, um, also two G7 economies um, with Canada and Japan. Um, it is a high-quality agreement. Um, um, you know, as well as opening up new um, export opportunities for members, um, you know, through traditional um, market access measures, um, it does have high standard rules. Um, and from New Zealand's perspective, very much, um, you know, setting the standard for what we would like to do um, with other agreements. Um, the other thing, just looking back on 2019, I think it's worth um, recalling um, and appreciating that CPTPP um, was very fast to enter into force. It was signed in March to, of 2019, um, and at the time of signature, um, the um, participants um, sort of set quite an ambitious objective of, of entering into force within one year, um, and in fact, that objective was, was surpassed. Um, uh, CPTPP entered into force um, on the 30th of December of that year, so um, nine or so months after signature, um, with the first six um, ratifications, um, and then actually the seventh, of course, followed very quickly thereafter, um, which was Vietnam um, on the 17th of January. Um, you know, following um, ratification, um, RCEP um, parties um, very quickly got down to business. Um, so the first uh, joint Commission meeting um, was actually held uh, in Tokyo on the 19th um, of January 2019. So that's um, you know a matter of um, a couple of weeks after um, the agreement entered into force, um, and um, you know that was followed again quite rapidly um, in October 2019 with a second uh, joint committee meeting. So very quickly down to business um, for CPTPP. Um, and uh, the implications for New Zealand, um, you know, overall it was a um, significant commercial uh, impact for us. Um, our modelling um, has predicted, and we will wait to see whether this plays out or not, but um, our modelling has um, predicted that it could um, have a positive uh, impact on New Zealand's GDP of up to 1% of our GDP, which is um, about 4 billion New Zealand dollars. Um, immediate impacts from tariff savings, which I'll talk a little bit more, bit more about shortly. Um, and most significantly for New, Ze New Zealand from a sort of traditional um, new market access point of view um, is the fact that CPTPP um, brought three new FTA partners for New Zealand, um, and that is with Canada, Japan, and Mexico. Um, and an interesting contrast um, with um, RCEP um, from that point of view, which I can touch on a little bit um, shortly. So um, the second point, um, CPTPP uh, in its second year, um, 2020, and of course, um, this was a year um, when COVID hit us. Um, and so interesting to, to start to think about whether CPTPP um, has you know, enabled um, our um, economy's um, resilience um, to that significant economic shock. From our point of view, um, you know, we um, are quite confident that CTPP, CPTPP is already proving um, its worth um, in terms of um, uh, assisting, enabling New Zealand's recovery from COVID. Um, and that's partly from um, the, um, you know, the, the new market access um, that New Zealand um, has gained through that agreement. Interestingly, um, you know, as we sit here um, you know, at the end of, um, end of 2020, um, there has, in fact, um, you know, already been um, three rounds of tariff cuts um, in, our set, uh, in CPTPP. Uh, the first one, of course, at entry into force in December, followed very quickly um, by the year two um, tariff cuts um, in January um, of 2019, um, or April in the case of, of Japan. Um, and then a third round, of course, um, at the beginning of this year as well. So, um, you know, when we look at New Zealand's... Um, uh, trade patterns this year, um, which have, of course, been disrupted by COVID. 
um, overall decline um, in our exports globally, um, but um, interestingly to CPTPP partners, um, overall um, a 2% increase um, um, in, the, um, in the year to date. Um, and just briefly some examples, um, focusing on the sort of the new, um, new partners. Um, in, in Japan, for example, um, New Zealand's fruit exports um, in the first half of this year have increased um, 30%. Um, other, other products, uh, including honey um, and frozen beef, um, we're seeing, um, you know, first half year sales um, that are already exceeding um, 2019 levels. Uh, similar picture um, for other products um, into Canada and Mexico. Um, so that's just sort of the raw numbers, but also, you know, stepping back a bit and looking at, um, you know, some of the really important impacts of COVID, um, for example, on employment. Um, in New Zealand, um, while um, you know there has been a significant economic shock, um, it's interesting that um, you know our export sector um, has um, maintained, and I think as, as others have observed, um, export of goods in particular um, has, has held up and proved remarkably resilient, um, and certainly um, into CPTPP markets um, uh, that is especially so, um, and that is very important um, for the employment statistics in New Zealand um, because that flows from. Um, some of our internal analysis, which shows um, you know, quite a clear uh, linkage between um, New Zealand firms um, that are internationally connected um, through uh, exporting, um, as opposed to New Zealand firms that just service the domestic market. Um, and the data shows quite clearly that the um, firms that are engaged in the exporting um, um, pay more, pay higher wages, and also more productive. Um, and so, um, you know, a clear linkage between, um, you know, the, the recovery of our export sector um, with employment, which is really important. L uh, like, uh, linked with that, um, my third point um, around New Zealand's trade recovery strategy. Um, and, you know, briefly, um, I mean, as people will know, um, I think, you know, New Zealand's health response has been very successful in the sense that um, we have been able to, you know, return to, um, to pretty much normal life. Um, but of course, um, we have, um, like everybody, suffered a, a very significant economic shock. Um, and we, um, we have in place um, a trade recovery strategy, um, which recognises the importance um, of New Zealand's export sector to our sort of broader um, economic recovery. And that's going back to some of the data I was talking about before about the importance um, of, um, of our exporting companies, you know, economy, including in employment. Um, and so we've got sort of three um, arms to our trade recovery strategy. Um, we've referred to it as the three R's. Um, so the first one is what we call retooling exporter support. So that's really just um, leaning in, um, putting a little bit more resource um, and effort um, into helping, helping our exporters um, both uh, in market and to market. Um, the second one is around reinvigorating um, the international trade architecture. Um, and that's just simply building on the, you know, the very clear um, analytical picture, which shows that trade agreements, um, you know, with the certainty um, uh, and the transparency that they provide, um, really do assist um, our companies uh, reach um, international markets, which, um, as we said before, is a very important part of our broader economic recovery. And, and then the third part of our trade recovery yeah. strategy is um, refreshing um, sort of key trading relationships and that's around diversity. Um, so both CPTPP and RCEP um, play an important role in that trade recovery strategy. Um, CPTPP, um, I mean, Dr. Menon made the point um, or the suggestion that um, missing in action um, during COVID. Um, I kind of know, um, you know, where that comment comes from, but from now we see it a little bit different um, because we see that CPTPP members um, have already taken a lead um, and you know for um, you know New Zealand, New Zealand and Singapore for example um, spearheaded the joint statement on supply chains which has uh, expanded out to a wider group of, of members um, and then within CPTPP itself um, it's continued to function well. Um, we've um, maintained you know the full suite of committee meetings across the year um, and it's focused on some of the practical steps under the agreement, um, for example, around supply chains and use of digital technology. Uh, and also the growing interest in accession to CPTPP, I think, um, does shore up um, you know, the, the broader system, which is helpful um, in terms of a COVID uh, response. And then finally, um, just briefly on RCEP, um, I think, as has already been mentioned, um, an incredibly valuable signal. I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't undersell the importance of getting um, an agreement signed and not just any agreement, you know, the largest FTA in the world, 30% of world GDP, almost a third of the world's population.
an incredible achievement, achievement at any time. Um, but to get that agreement concluded and signed, um, you know, in the year that we're coming towards the end of now, I think is, um, is, is, a, is pretty amazing um, and does send um, a very, very important signal. Um, you know, for New Zealand, um, RCEP is um, an extremely important region. It contains seven out of our top 10 trading partners. It's already the destination of over half of our exports, uh, the source of over 60% of our foreign direct investment. Um, so an incredibly um, uh, important agreement. And, interesting, and interestingly, incredibly important, even though we already had FTAs with all of the other 14 members. Um, and so a little bit counterintuitive there, but you know, the economic modelling is very clear um, RCEP, um, despite having no new market access for New Zealand in terms of additional tariff cuts, um, still has a significant um, economic impact. Um, and, you know, that's from the consolidating impact, it's from having a single rule of origin for the whole RCEP region, um, it's from the transparency, additional transparency rules, it's from the simplification of exporting documents, it's from cutting red tape for our exporters, uh, measures that address non-tariff barriers, all of those, you know, quite small on their own, quite small and insignificant measures. Um, but put together um, in a consolidating agreement like RCEP, um, you know, our analysis has shown um, does have a real economic impact. Uh, for New Zealand, uh, $2 billion additional to our GDP once um, fully implemented. Um, and some, some other analysis, not done by us, but um, done by um, um, other international economists, um, show that RCEP will add $186 billion to the world economy. Um, and also, um, you know, um, have a, quite a big impact on, on supply chains in the RCEP region as well. Um, so I'll leave it there. So thanks very much, Andrew. Thank you so much, Mr. Riley. Um, I'm actually also with Dr. Menon in, initially. I thought CPTPP is rather quiet, but I think, you know, thank you for giving us the insider story. Uh, in the eyes of the person who are frontline in the negotiation. I mean, maybe perhaps CPTPP needs a better PR company to show its contribution. I mean, jokes aside, uh, I'm glad to hear that, you know, CPTPP and RCEP is one of the contributors to the recovery of New Zealand. And uh, and I agree with you as well, RCEP is actually a very important signal uh, in, in this time. Um, well, I think um, actually I ran over time, but I will still want to open Q&A session I'm not alone in this. I'm with my co-moderator and I'm honored to have with me Dr. Jivita Muhammad, a fellow from, of economics in ISIS, uh, who will be supervising this session. I'll open the floor now to talk about the outlook of RRC and CBTBP. Thank you, Andrew. We have a question from Hirono-san from Japan PEGP. He asked um, what changes will be brought to CPTPP when Biden joins the agreement, hopefully next year. It looks today that Biden's approach to um, FTAs, as shown in the Democratic Party's tradition, will be more in favor to soft rather than hard um, integration. So um, the question is for all of the panelists. Anyone who wants to take this question? Maybe we should uh, try and get an American to answer this question uh, from the larger group. Okay, maybe I'll just say a few things, uh, Andrew, if, uh, and get things going. Um, I think it's not clear that uh, clear at all that uh, the U.S. will come back into the CPTPP uh, 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 with the Biden uh, administration. Uh, a lot of things have happened uh, since um, uh, CPP CPTPP was um, uh, kicked off, and it might be, maybe too much water has passed under the bridge now for the U.S. to return. Uh, only time will tell. I mean. Uh, uh, President-elect Biden has his own Made in All of America agreement, which suggests that, you know, he's not a raging free trader by any means. Um, although we expect that, you know, he will embrace multilateralism and a rules-based order to a greater degree than his predecessor. Uh, so I think that will be a good thing. And perhaps the way forward is through a new agreement, uh, so there's less baggage, uh, and that, of course, is provided by FTAP, um, an APEC initiative. Uh, that could be the way uh, to bring uh, 
China and the U.S. together, um, at least um, you know, uh, uh, to deal with uh, to, to reduce the number of disputes. But of course, uh, you know, even before the ink was dry on RCEP, we have a mini trade war between China and Australia taking place. So, uh, you know, uh, this might not be the best time to be proposing a very ambitious agreement, but that might be the way forward. Can I add a little bit? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think because uh, CPTPP uh, offers uh, environment uh, issue, uh, I think it will uh, take perhaps uh, attentions from the US uh, and uh, given the uh, Biden uh, from the uh, uh, <coughs> Democrat Party and before the uh, president candidate uh, Hillary Clinton's really enthusiast, uh, in uh, TPP before the CPTPP, so I think uh, perhaps yeah, uh, uh, US will uh, take CPTPP as a, as a considerations. And if this is so, uh, I think it's good for the CPTPP itself because uh, as I found, um, CPTPP has a divergence uh, uh, in terms of characters, uh, bias on high income, and need uh, more hard regionalism uh, uh, approach and need strong le uh, country uh, leadership. Uh, strong country leadership means that a country that high uh, in terms of GDP size uh, and also high in terms of uh, high income level. So complete uh, figures of the strong uh, uh, country that need to uh, give, um, uh, how to call it, uh, uh, strong guidance uh, for the organizations. And the CPTPP needs that. And perhaps U.S. needs also this uh, from the perspective of environment uh, issue that uh, RCP doesn't have uh, that kind of issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, for me also, I think it's very hard to read into this one because the original TPP was actually negotiated under the Obama administration. And I would actually thought that Biden may have some sensitive, or sorry, um, may have some sentimental values, you know, and may want to join back. But then again, you know, your, good, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, anyone want to chip in on this question or, you know, Jivita, is there any other question that you would like? Uh, uh, can, can, I have, can I have a comment? Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Go on, uh, Dr. Dr. Wu. Uh, uh, basically, uh, just uh, two things. One is, uh, you know, the CPTPP or TPP that's very open, right, uh, to any country if you, uh, uh, you know, can meet the demand, you know, standard of the CPTPP, you can join. So together with the uh, willingness, uh, we talk about uh, whether U.S. can join or even China are uh, willing to join. But I think uh, other countries also, you know, look at that. Uh, many uh, ASEAN members, South Korea, UK, you know. So that means that uh, TPP and CPTPP is quite, quite attractive, right, uh, for the many countries to consider to join. So, in that case, uh, the experience of Vietnam, New Zealand, and many other member of CPTPP is very important. You, know, you look at how the TPP and CPTPP can you know, contribute to the process of mitigating the impact of the conflict uh, trade between US, China, and also the COVID-19. So I see here is an uh, attractiveness of uh, CPTPP, and I think uh, one day ASEP can be so attractive. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think in interest of time, uh, Juvita, do we still have any questions on the floor or? We have a few questions, but I will... Um, consolidate, perhaps consolidate it. Yes, yeah. um, so one is from uh, Zara Khan on um, the negotiation and implementation of trade agreements taking into account obligations from the Paris Agreement to cut emissions and ensure trade and development um, to recognize global commitments to address uh, climate change. So what are the panelists' view on this? Um, thank you. As usual, I'm opening the floor to everyone uh, who wants to respond to this. Andrew, shall I start? Um, I mean, just to note from, from New Zealand's point of view, um, 
um, you know, the um, uh, inclusion of uh, environmental considerations is a priority for us in our trade agreements. Um, it's one um, clear difference between CPTPP and RCEP. CPTPP um, has um, uh, an environment chapter um, with um, some, you know, some quite serious rules in it um, and rules that are enforceable as well, um, you know, under um, dispute settlement. Um, RCEP does not have an environment chapter. Um, and so that was, um, you know, from New Zealand's point of view, um, that was a disappointing outcome, if I'm honest. Um, but um, one that is mitigated um, by the fact that uh, New Zealand already has uh, trade and environment agreements with, um, with most other um, RCEP participants. Thanks. Okay, I think for the interest of time, uh, uh, we have to wrap up. Um, the panelists, I think, still can respond through the chat session, but I would like to thank everyone here and especially the panelists for this wonderful uh, how to say discussion. Uh, back to you, Juwita. Thank you, Associate Professor Andrew. As, as with before, may I please request for the role players, uh, Associate Professor Andrew, Dr. Vo, Dr. Kiki, Dr. Jayan, and Mr. Barney to switch on or leave on your video for us to take a group photo. All other panelists, please switch off your videos and try to make this quick because we're running a bit over time. All right, I've just gotten a cue that we're good to proceed with the third and final session of today's proceedings. For plenary session three, accelerating solutions to climate change, can markets transition to a low carbon economy? I am pleased to invite Dr. Yose Rizal Damuri to moderate. Dr. Yose, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me quite well? Yes. Loud yes, well. all right, okay. Uh, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good morning here uh, from Jakarta. Uh, 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 it is good to be back among colleagues and friends in this uh, PCC general meeting, or the only virtually. Um, my name is Jose Rizal Damuri. I am the co-chair of Indonesian Committee on Pacific Economic Cooperations. Uh, this morning, I will chair the sessions on climate change with the big questions, uh, can market transition to labor uh, to low carbon economy? Um, we are a bit uh, uh, late starting this, uh, this sessions. Uh, so I will be, make it quick um, for the introductions, but I think it's, it should be quite important uh, to say that the climate change has been affecting our livelihood uh, and, and we already uh, feel uh, the the uh, effect of, of this climate uh, the the change the rising temperatures already changing our, our way of life um, and then already altering weather patterns and the low carbon initiative have been promoted as an appropriate response to fight the climate change um, at the core of low carbon initiative is still uh, energy efficiency and the use of clean energy but the implementation is actually far reaching from just energy transition. Uh, it also means a transition uh, on economic activities and the way of goods and services are being produced, the way goods and people are being transported and also uh, the way infrastructure being developed, developed uh, and many other transformations. Uh, one thing here is to emphasize that low carbon initiative has a lot of economic implications. The, uh, the transformation cannot come freely uh, it requires a lot of efforts, financing, investment, uh, also uh, 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 other aspects of the economy need to change. Uh, so in order to low car uh, carbon initiative to work, it has to be embraced by the market and also the economy. Uh, business need to take into account all these uh, 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 issues into their business decision and calculation. But uh, it's not only for business. The consumers also need uh, to pay uh, the price of externalities and change the consumption behavior. And it would not be an easy task. Uh, so in these sessions, we will look at the, whether market and economy can uh, overcome and uh, also can uh, respond to that transitions uh, 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 in a good way. 
uh, what kind of challenges that business and economy are facing to make transition to lower carbon activities and what are potential support and momentum that may facilitate such transition easier. So to discuss about it, uh, the climate change and how the market uh, can respond to the uh, and embrace low carbon uh, economy, we have three experts here who are not only familiar with uh, climate change issues uh, and low carbon initiative, but also uh, 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 a very knowledgeable on the business uh, rules and the market rules or, on the issues. Um, but before asking the speakers uh, to talk, uh, I'd like to mention several housekeeping rules here in these sessions, uh, since we don't really have enough time and it's or uh, I, I guess it's already late in the uh, in the other part of uh, Pacific. So I will limit the speaker to speak for around eight minutes uh, and I will give note to the speaker when the remaining time is one minute. Um, and then after all presentations, we will start the discussion. Participants can use a Q&A platform to ask questions or give comments uh, to the panelists. So, and then we will select questions and read them for the panelists to respond. Um, I would like to invite uh, the fir our first speaker uh, to discuss about the issues. Uh, and then the first speaker is Dr. Richard Cantor uh, to present uh, his thought on the issues at hand. Uh, Dr. Richard Cantor is the chair of United States Committee for Pacific Economic Operations. He has also served as chief credit officer for Moody Corporation and Moody's Investor Services. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Richard Cantor will talk about, I think we'll talk about the increasing momentum towards uh, the net zero emissions and some factors behind it. So Richard, uh, the time is yours, please. Thank you, Yoste. Uh, so um, thank you also to the organizers. It's really uh, fantastic to be invited to participate on this panel and uh, look forward to the discussion. Uh, this year may mark a turning point in our transition to a low carbon economy. The pandemic, uh, rather than causing the transition to slow, seems to have strengthened the resolve to reduce carbon footprints. 125 nations are now committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050, along with a growing number of subnational governments, corporations, and investors who have made similar pledges. And with the change in its government, the U.S. is now expected to re-engage on climate in a similarly constructive manner. Lastly, in the run-up to COP26, we can expect even more ambitious commitments from the public and private sectors. Somewhat surprising, with much of the economy slumping, the, the green economy is kind of red hot, uh, with vacancies for green blue-collar jobs such as solar panel installers, and even more for green white collar jobs, uh, such as experts in green finance. The world's stock markets also seem to be going green with valuations depressed for fossil fuel companies and sky high for electric car manufacturers. But even with this positive momentum, there remain daunting challenges to a smooth transition to net zero including an urgent need to improve the quantity, quality, and comparability of climate-related financial disclosures. As it is often said, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. That's why uh, in 2015, the Financial Stability Board established the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or the TCFD, which, which, I've, which I've had the uh, good fortune to be able to participate in. In the rest of my remarks, I will highlight some of the TCFD's current focus areas and touch on the work of a recently formed task force on the scaling of voluntary carbon markets. The TCFD uh, first recommended a voluntary disclosure framework in 2017, which has since gained broad private sector support. Over 750 financial firms representing over $150 trillion in assets have endorsed the framework and over half of the world's largest corporations now reference the TCFD in their public reporting. And in many jurisdictions, TCFD aligned disclosures are likely to be made mandatory in the near future. 
This past October, the TCFD published a stock take on the quality of climate-related disclosures and financial filings, finding that while the number of firms preparing TCFD-aligned reports is growing, the quality and depth of those disclosures are often insufficient to dimension company responses to the risks and opportunities presented by climate change. In response, in the next few months, the TCFD is likely to release additional guidance on how to more effectively present climate-related metrics and targets. The next TCFD guidance document is also likely to emphasize that in addition to reporting scope one and scope two emissions, more firms should report their scope three emissions. As a reminder, scope one emissions result directly from a firm's operations and scope two emissions come from the energy consumed as a result of those operations. In contrast, scope three emissions are not under a firm's direct control, but rather reflect the emissions that arise elsewhere in the firm's value chain, both upstream and downstream from the operations of its suppliers and from the uses of its products by its customers. Scope three emissions can be more consequential than scope one and two. For example, fossil fuel producers and automotive manufacturers contribute to global warming, not so much because of the carbon they emit in their production processes or through the energy they consume, but rather through the emissions <clears throat> produced by their customers as they use their products. Similarly, food processing companies contribute to global warming through their supply chains, such as beef suppliers and their distribution networks, such as trucking services. Focusing on a firm's scope three emissions may create pressure on suppliers and customers who may not have yet embraced the green agenda to reduce their carbon footprints as well. Pressure is also growing on financial institutions to adapt to the risks and opportunities presented by climate change. Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England and current UN envoy on climate finance, has even argued that financial institutions need to take climate risk into account in all their underwriting and investment decisions, just like they consider credit and interest rate risks today. The TCFD has encouraged companies to conduct scenario analysis and test resilience of their business strategies against climate risks. And bank and insurance companies are now asking the entities they regulate to do the same. These exercises will increase awareness about climate risk, identify important data gaps, and build in-house expertise. More and more investors are searching for investment vehicles that will channel their savings into activities aligned with the transition to a low carbon world, both because they believe it's the right thing to do and because they believe the investments are more likely to offer high returns. Of late, investing in turn in firms that lean green is proving rewarding as the valuation of green companies has grown more rapidly than those of brown companies over the past year. Meeting this investor demand, the TCFD and others are working to develop forward-looking measures of alignment in investment portfolios to the Paris commitments. The goal is to construct a simple summary metric, sometimes referred to as portfolio temperatures, such as one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, so on. However, the current level of disclosure around firm strategies uh, may not be yet sufficient in order to support reliable metrics of this kind. Lastly, I want to report on the Task Force for Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets, which first convened in September and then in November released its first study and call for comments. Carbon credits purchased voluntarily enable organizations to compensate or neutralize emissions not yet eliminated. That can be achieved by financing the avoidance of or reduction in emissions from other sources or through the outright removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. A transparent, credible market for carbon credits would serve many purposes. First, it would spur investment in carbon reduction projects and carbon capture technologies by providing a direct means to monetize those efforts. Second, the price discovery process would reveal a term structure for the price of carbon, which would help governments assess whether additional policy measures are needed to achieve net zero and would help private companies as they design their own pathways to net zero. And third, it would generate private capital flows to less developed countries that are home to the projects that are likely to have the highest decarbonization potential. To sum up, momentum toward net zero is growing 
And this year, further progress will be supported by the following initiatives. One, making TCFD aligned disclosure mandatory in many jurisdictions. Two, increasing the focus on scope three emissions. Three, improving reporting on metrics, targets, and scenario analysis. Four, developing forward-looking measures of investment portfolio alignment. And lastly, five, working to develop and scale private carbon markets. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to the rest of our discussion. Thank you, Richard, uh, for the, uh, I, I think, quite uh, interesting uh, presentations. Uh, Richard basically uh, talked that the, this, that the moment actually uh, provides a lot of momentum uh, to uh, pursue for greater uh, uh, low carbon economy, the, um, to embrace more low carbon economy. Um, and then uh, he mentions about the, uh, he mentions about the um, uh, several instruments that actually uh, support that kind of uh, momentum, including also uh, how, including also the de developments of uh, financial disclosure, uh, the TCFD, that would uh, be uh, quite in uh, critical and instrumental uh, to the, the uh, to the uh, developments of low carbon economy. Uh, we will move to the next uh, speaker which is, uh, we have here uh, Datin Sri Sunita Rajakumar, uh, who is also quite uh, very knowledgeable about the climate change issue. Uh, she, is, she is the founding member of Climate Governance Initiative Malaysia. Uh, this, uh, that, that is the country chapter of the World Economic Forum's Climate uh, Governance Initiative. Uh, that in Sunita, I think, will look at some nuance related to the need for business uh, to be mindful about their decisions related to the carbon initiative. So, uh, that in uh, that in three, uh, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Yossi. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I wanted to share with you some thoughts because I have, I'm sharing this panel with two other very esteemed speakers and in the risk of uh, repeating ourselves, I'm trying to um, highlight topics which are not ordinarily uh, thought through. And these are topics which I think from the private sector point of view, uh, we are very interested in. So of course, uh, locally in Malaysia, we had a great demonstration of leadership by Petronas, which became the first oil company in Asia to set a net zero target. We're waiting for the details, but this is a tremendous demonstration of leadership and we want to applaud this because increasingly investors are putting pressure on companies and the example I'm showing here is a group of 38 investors overseeing more than 9 trillion in assets, part of the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, and they are urging the audit committee of more than 30 of Europe's largest companies to ensure that their financial statements reflect the implications of Paris because corporate accounts are becoming disjointed from their public statements on climate change. Many groups are setting out plans to cut their emissions, but this is not being reflected in their financial outlook. And if the accounts leave out material climate risks, capital is going to be misguided. Another example is the IFRS, which set out guidance when it comes to assessing financial statement materiality. And they went so far as to say that even if a company determines that its impairment testing does not need to include a specific assumption, taking into account investor comments on the importance of climate-related risks, it may need to disclose information that explains clearly why the carrying amount of its assets are not exposed to climate risk. This is because the science, the data, the climate modeling is so established right now that even if you're not impacted, IFRS guidance is stating that you should disclose why it is not. Because the presumption is that the board of directors would have applied its mind to this top financial risk, which is the climate crisis, and considered whether it should be disclosed or not. So of course, investor engagement in climate has been rising over the last few years, whether in terms of the number of climate-related shareholder proposals or those who are voting in favor. As a matter of fact, it's gone even further and two months ago, the Spanish airport operator became the first company in the world to give shareholders an annual vote on 
its climate plans. And this is something that uh, the UN Envoy on Climate Finance, Mark Carney, has also said last month, that investors should have an automatic advisory vote on a company's plans, its climate strategy, rather than being overly prescriptive on plans by, with, with the authorities, it may be desirable for investors to have a say on this transition. And this would establish a critical link between responsibility, accountability on one hand, and sustainability. So investors are th thinking that this is going to ensure that companies take their climate commitments seriously. The Canadian pension fund, CDPQ, has gone even further and they are aligning their climate strategy with employees' variable compensation. That means this is now part of your bonus targets. So this is taking it even further. And what is really important, which a lot of businesses in the private sector needs to be aware of, is that your professed values absolutely need to align with business operations. If not, you are in danger of being caught out, and this includes being subject to litigation as well. So let's take a look at this climate poll, which was run to, uh, last, at the beginning of last month. It started off at nine in the morning. Shell has about half a million followers on Twitter, and this looks like a very straightforward climate poll, um, which received less than 200 votes. What are you willing to change to help reduce emissions? Are you willing to offset? Are you going to stop flying, buying electric vehicle, or even purchase renewable energy. But by four o'clock, mainstream media was saying that this was a spectacular backfire. Why did they say this? Because opinion leaders had picked up on this and their tweets were getting up to 400,000 likes, that they were willing to hold them accountable for lying about climate change and not disclosing the real truth behind the uh, carbon economy. And so if businesses are not aligned to their professed values, this is the sort of uh, attention or a risk to reputation that they are going to be facing. So of course you have some countries which for the past 130 years have been busy building hospitals and schools and ports and roads. And understandably the per capita emission levels are increasing. However, for more developed countries, they are starting to bend the curve down. And so how does this come, transpire in terms of fairness? What are our common but differentiated responsibilities that we need to take? It's a very difficult question. And if one third of your country is underwater, as Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been saying in this op-ed in the Financial Times, she is pointing out that the G20 countries are responsible for 80% of total emissions, while the bottom 100 only account for 3.5%. So how are we going to tackle climate challenge without significant action from everyone? So increasingly, this is going to be the call. What is your responsibility, not just my responsibility? So China had a tremendous announcement during United Nations General Assembly on the 22nd of September. And exactly three weeks later, Tsinghua University came up with their plan of how China could meet its net zero target by 2060. And this is going to be the case with a lot of countries in this region, that for at least the next few years, you're going to have to carry on on an increasing curve before you uh, reach your peak, and then you start to bend the curve. And how steeply you want to bend the curve depends on political will, the level of climate ambition, and how easily you can reduce deeply entrenched emissions. So this is the heart, the nub of the problem that when you look at the difference between consumption and production emissions, it's very clear that there will be some countries that are consumption-based countries and some that produce more to be exported. And so even when G20 or developed countries set net zero targets, they could be accused by their own Office of National Statistics of outsourcing carbon emissions to developing countries. And this is why Dr. Richard Cantor was stressing that TCFD is starting to look at scope three as well, because otherwise you end up outsourcing your carbon emissions. Here's another complexity that we should think about. In trying to decarbonize the economy, some countries are outlawing internal combustion engines and pivoting towards electric vehicles. However, electric vehicles also have huge resource and environmental implications on the environment. Just to meet the UK's electric car targets in the next three decades, you need multiples of the world's current production of rare earth minerals. 
And so the scientists in this statement are saying, look, there are huge implications for our natural resources. The global supply of raw materials absolutely needs to change drastically. And society needs to understand that there is a raw material cost of going green as well. And we need to more closely evaluate this. In addition, lithium, for example, which is used in the batteries, market analysts are predicting a 12-fold increase in the value of the recycling industry and an 18-fold increase in the uh, EU uh, private sector. And so these are the implications that businesses need to be very mindful of. Otherwise, they will be accused of not being aligned to their professed values. So of course, we're recognizing that climate change is a classic market failure. The costs are borne by society at large, while the benefits accrues to those who are making profits out of this. So we need to have a price of carbon to be able to substantially advance the debate within industry. This is already happening around the world. There are 61 carbon pricing initiatives uh, in 46 national jurisdictions. And um, although the US withdrew from Paris last month, the beginning of last month, but the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, their very first recommendation was they need a price on carbon. It needs to be fair across the entire economy and it must be aligned with Paris. This is going to be the single most important step to manage climate risk and to drive the appropriate allocation of capital. What is the private sector saying? Goldman Sachs has estimated that the imputed price is already 80 US dollars per metric ton. There's not a lot of businesses that can pivot away from a cost like this. And even worse, Swiss Re, one of the world's largest reinsurers, has said that their current shadow price is eight US dollars per metric ton. Starting from next year, they're going to impute internally 100 US dollars per ton. In Malaysia, we've had some analysis and Darshan Josie is now with ISIS, starting from implied cost of a social cost of cap carbon of 32 ringgit all the way up to 170 ringgit this year and increasing as we can see. So another implication of the cost of carbon is that uh, with some economies as part of their new green deal, they're also including measures such as carbon border adjustment mechanism to reduce the possibility of carbon leakage, which will occur when companies transfer production to countries that are less strict about emissions. So it's not just about avoiding carbon leakage, but also you want to raise climate ambition elsewhere. So the EU is trying to use this as a negotiation strategy as well. But of course, there are some claims that carbon border taxes are unjust because you're punishing developing countries for carbon emissions and they're also investing in fossil fuel extraction there. And so this is a post, for example, by Ben Caldecott of Oxford University. And he's saying that the original cohort of coal plants in the 2017 portfolio of Swiss financial institutions, they had increased their capacity by 50%. So someone is still funding them. <clears throat> So understandably, an overwhelming majority of people want change. And not just that, it's 86% of 21,000 people in 28 countries. Because the richest 10% are accountable for 46% of total emissions and the poorest 50% accountable for just 6% of total emissions growth. So the current economic model has been an enabler of catastrophic climate change and equally catastrophic inequality. In Malaysia, uh, excuse at our me, Datin, uh, uh, can we wrap up in one minute or less? Yes, thank yes. you, Dr. Yossi. In Malaysia, this is the extreme heat days that we are looking at, and we are already on the border of this. Put another way, in just three decades from now, virtually all of 360 days are going to be extreme heat days. We also have land areas at risk of flooding, and this comes all the way into very close to the Klang Valley. We are, our, our power grid is still 93% fossil fuel, so we need to pivot away from that. We are very dependent on food supply imports. And at the beginning of COVID, Vietnam decided that they were not going to export because they had sufficient, uh, they were worried about their domestic supplies. So this is what climate governance is talking about. On boards, what are the principles? Who, who is accountable? Make sure that you have command of the subject matter, materiality assessments, and so on and so forth. Because when you're seeing scenes like this around the world, there is going to be a call for accountability. And this is what the private sector needs to be aware of. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosie.
Oke, okay. thank you very much uh, uh, Datin Sri Sunita Raja Kumar to give us the, the context and also the uh, current pictures of, of the issues. And it is quite interesting that uh, uh, you, you can see pressures uh, to business and also to the economy as well as uh, from the market that, uh, that uh, can uh, make business Uh, uh, involve more uh, in the sustainable uh, uh, activities. Uh, and we also see that uh, various an initiative actually also already uh, have been, uh, uh, have been uh, proposed, uh, pr uh, proposed and also has been, uh, has been even conducted here in, uh, in many, uh, 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 many countries. Um, the, Well, I'm gonna invite the third speaker of our sessions, which is um, uh, Mr. Eugene Wong. Uh, Mr. Eugene Wong is the Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Finance Institute Asia Limited. Uh, we, uh, I think, Mr. Eugene Wong, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I must say the comments made by uh, Sunita and Richard were absolutely spot on and, and very brilliant. Um, and, you know, the, the question for us in ASEAN is really uh, not a question of can we, but how do we transition? Uh, we, we are actually in a situation where six of the ASEAN countries is actually amongst the 20 most vulnerable nations to climate change. And we don't do anything about it by uh, 2100, our GDP is going to decline by 11%. Now we've seen islands in Indonesia submerging. We've experienced over between 2014 and 2017, we've had 200 over floods, 200 over cyclones. It's a serious material impact on us. So I'd like to maybe uh, just take on from where my fellow panelists uh, uh, started and I like to extrapolate that into an ASEAN context. But let's, let's take a step back and look at what the drivers of, um, of transition really are. And we, we look at it, there are really three. The first is regulatory impetus. So if a government comes and says, I'm committed to a net zero, that really helps. Uh, we've seen that with the UK, Japan, Korea for 2050, China for 2060, like uh, uh, my pan fellow panelists have mentioned. And in the UK has cemented its commitment in law, for example. Um, the second is actually pure economics. So if we look at transition, it's not just about using less, it's about using more efficiently and using with less carbon. So what does that really mean? It means technology, technology has to come in. Um, and it's, it's all about economics because technology has improved so much that between 2010 and 2019, we've seen the price of PV drop 82%. We've seen the price of uh, concentrating solar panels drop 47%. Um, onshore wind, offshore wind, it's uh, 40 and uh, 29%. So we do see a lot of reductions in cost there. The second is actually costing of ex externalities. And my, my fellow panelists talked, uh, Sunita talked about uh, carbon pricing, Richard talked about carbon pricing. So that the carbon taxes, externalities are being costed in and distortions are being reduced. So that's another impact. And of course, uh, Richard talked about um, really the risk of uh, impairment, the risk of uh, um, stranded assets. These are very important because it changes the cost of capital. It means that when people assess the viability of projects and they build these things in, they would actually understand that there is going to be a cost and therefore these projects become less attractive. Importantly also, uh, with the number of institutions who are refusing or moving away from financing coal, we find that refinancing also becomes a risk. So all these economic drivers actually also move people away uh, from the traditional uh, polluting uh, energy sources. And of course, importantly, behavior. Um, we, we know that uh, in the last year alone, we have a total of uh, um, commitments consisting of more than half of the US GDP saying that we want to move away from uh, coal most of them by 2050. And uh, Sunita pointed out the uh, commitment by Petronas, which was quite groundbreaking. Investors are also demanding that they move away uh, from uh, non-green non sources. So in the EU, for example, 57% uh, of investors said that uh, by 2025, 
they are going to really take into account ESG factors and 77 of them, 77% of them have actually said that in the next two years, we're going to stop investing in non-traditional uh, non-ESG products, in, sorry, in traditional non-ESG products. And 140 over financial institutions who are globally significant have said, we have coal exit plans. There's also a lot of pressure from society because we see the protests, we see the uprising from consumers, we see the unhappiness from uh, employees. So there's a lot of pressure moving all this. Globally, of course, it works. But what about ASEAN? I mean, we face a lot of issues in ASEAN. Our challenges are very different. Let, let's take GDP, for example. Our GDP uh, in ASEAN ranges from 1,000. So let's look at GDP per capita, right? It ranges from 1,500 per capita to 65,000. So ASEAN countries have very different economic, political, and social structures. And the market's at different stages of development, which means it's very hard for us to introduce one particular layer uh, of solutions. Also, coal is very much hardwired in because if you look at how much we are going to use coal as a percentage of our energy mix, it actually increases from 2014 at 36% to 42% by 2030. LNG, which is cleaner, decreases from 40% to 30%. And we're going to spend 61% of our investments in power generation in fossil fuel um, our solutions. So this, this is a challenge that we have to face. And we look at the solutions we've come up with to respond to COVID. They were all social safety nets mainly. Uh, there was very little of a green recovery. So this points to where the focus of ASEAN is. So what do we need to do? Well, I guess we have to focus a lot on transition because our economies aren't ready for a hard shock. We have to look at a combination of adaptation, mitigation, and offsets. I mean, we, we did talk about um, you know, whether or not we should be purchasing credits. Uh, and offsets in ASEAN probably means not so much purchasing, but looking at internal projects. So again, we need that sort of accountability. Uh, and of course, we, we, we lack capacity uh, everywhere from the markets to the regulators. Uh, we have to build that as well. And importantly, uh, Richard talked about TCFDs just now. We don't have a common glue to create accessibility for investors and certainty for issuers because people need frameworks. They need frameworks to know what they're doing is right. There's no greenwashing, for example, uh, the, the lowest the cost of due diligence, but we lack a consistent framework. And frameworks com comprise of taxonomies, uh, disclosure standards, and um, other types of standards. I mean, the closest thing we have to a regional standard is actually the ASEAN Green Bond Standards, the ASEAN Social Bond Standards, and the ASEAN Sustainability Bond Standards, which were issued by the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum, which I must say the takeoff has been very good. Why is it so hard to have a common standard in ASEAN? Well, firstly, the standards available globally don't meet the ASEAN needs. ASEAN's in a unique situation, as I explained just now. The second is that any standard that comes in is binding. So every country is really worried about how this standard is going to affect them economically, socially, and politically. <clears throat> and really, um, I, I think the last thing we need to do is to connect demand and supply. I mean, that's really an inefficient connection there. And that's because our markets are so fragmented. And our markets are fragmented because we have different efforts coming from different people. So we need to optimize that as well. Is this a bad thing? Uh, well, certainly these are a lot of challenges. Do we see light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, definitely, yes, because I think if you look at the financial sector, which is the lifeblood um, of providing solutions for greening the system and transitioning, it's really moving. It's really, really moved this year. And, and I must say all this happened even before the pandemic. So the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum, which comprises the 10 ASEAN Capital Markets Regulators, issued a roadmap for ASEAN Sustainable Capital Markets. The Working Committee on Capital Market Development, official ASEAN body comprising central banks, uh, ministries of finance, and the securities regulators, issued a report on promoting sustainable finance in ASEAN. Now, the two bodies have actually gotten together, form a joint working group, and will jointly implement this, their recommendations. The um, central banks have also come into play, and they have also issued a report um, really on how the role of central banks in ASEAN in addressing climate and environmental related risks. And again, there are solutions that all these solutions, all these implementation uh, plans are very consistent with each other. And lastly, I would say that the governments have come in because the 
ASEAN finance ministers and central bank governors at their last meeting in October committed to a more cohesive uh, plan towards sustainable finance and also for the working committees in ASEAN involved in financing to get together uh, to work more cohesively. So I, I'm going to end there. Uh, basically, I would say that transition is a must. It's not can we, it's how do we, and the whole uh, initiative is moving very quickly now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Wong, Mr. Eugene Wong. Uh, it is really good to hear about what happens uh, actually closer uh, at home here uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned that the, the driver for transition is actually there. Uh, a lot of support, a lot of uh, initiative that uh, we uh, we uh, can see at the moment uh, happening in uh, ASEAN countries and uh, and also in the regions. But the challenges uh, are also about, and we all we need to uh, pay more attention uh, on what's happening uh, in this region in order for us to uh, get a more uh, effective low carbon uh, initiative, low carbon economy uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, all right, uh, uh, I think we have all three presentations and now we're going to uh, have a Q&A uh, session here. Uh, for the Q&A sessions, I will be assisted by uh, Mr. Muhammad Sinatra. Um, and uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, there's already a Q&A uh, uh, questions uh, uh, for this session. Yeah. Uh, uh, Muhammad, can you uh, please assist me about that or still has no yeah. question? Yeah. Uh, uh, good, good, good afternoon, everyone from Kuala Lumpur. My name is Muhammad Sinatra, an analyst from uh, ISIS Malaysia. Uh, right now, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment, uh, okay. even raise hands. So I would invite any participants who have questions, please deliver your questions to the Q&A box or raise your hand using the raise hand functions. All right. Uh, anybody uh, from the uh, panelists or from the floor? If not, uh, maybe while waiting for the questions from participants, I will uh, be the ones who ask you questions. Uh, because because um, uh, listening to uh, your presentations uh, and also the presentations from uh, this morning sessions, uh, I, I wonder whether the current situations, the current pandemic uh, would uh, provide some kind of obstacles uh, in the low carbon economy uh, initiative. Because this morning, for example, Dr. Richard Record from the World Bank what bank mentions that there would be a sustained and longer term impact of the crisis to economic growth. Uh, he even estimated that the growth will be reduced by one percentage point for the decade ahead. And uh, I think it will impact the, the transformations because the, the transformation uh, uh, require investment, require financing, and require a lot of other uh, resources to be devoted. Uh, so uh, anybody would like uh, to uh, to explore this issue about the impact of uh, uh, COVID-19 and the crisis currently we have. Uh, I, I, I can give... Oh, Richard, please. Or Richard? Well, um, I, I think there are a few different forces at play that may work in different directions um, and differently for different countries. I mean, at a very high level, I think there's a, a greater public... Uh, appreciation for the importance of uh, investing for resilience against global threats uh, in the health area, but I think that that concept is going to be more broadly understood than before. Um, in terms of uh, the ability to fund uh, projects to support transition, uh, again, that'll vary by country. Uh, most of these you know, large investment projects um, um, require substantial capital, but the you know interest rates are low and will be low for some time. So in countries where there there is the ability to to, to accumulate more debt, um, I think uh, there'll be a big push to 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 take that debt on at the low interest rates. And I know I can speak just for the United States and what the way uh, President-elect Biden speaks about 
uh, efforts around climate change, he's packaging it very much as a, a, a benefit to the environment, but also as an opportunity to expand employment in new areas. So it's an opportunity to spend on infrastructure projects, broadly defined, um, that it's kind of relatively easy, I think, uh, to, to market to both Democrats and Republicans in the United States. So whether that's true in other countries, and of course there are other countries that have more borrowing constraints and, and, and other urgent problems to deal with where it may be more difficult. Uh, Mr. Wong, you have uh, yes. opinion or you have ideas? What? Yeah. Well, I, I generally, I generally agree with Richard. Actually, um, and mm. there are many forces moving at the same time and possibly in different directions. The first is actually the low interest rate, uh, because that certainly fuels uh, spending, but it it's also a risk that some of the without costing for externalities, some of the projects that we have um, may be distorted. So some of the polluting projects, for example, uh, you may find them cheaper than in the past. And this is not helped by low oil prices. Uh, so put together, this is something we worry about. Governments actually are moving uh, away from the traditional fiscal confines because they need to stimulate the economy. So this is an opportunity for them also to spend uh, on on long-term sustainable resilient uh, expenditure. Uh, this is good for green, but on the downside, um, a lot of jobs actually depend on what can be delivered immediately. So there could be a short-term focus versus a long-term focus. And if we, we look at the short-term focus, it's not necessarily going to be sustainable. So that's another worry that we have. Um, Following on from that, of course, is the issue about infrastructure. Well, we may have a lot of shovel-ready projects in the region. We have to make sure that they can fit within the infrastructure. So, for example, if we look at um, uh, the use of renewables, we need to ensure that this can fit within the grid, the grid, otherwise you have curtailment. So we need to address the infrastructure bottlenecks as well. Um, but we do know, and it's proven, that green jobs actually, uh, or green investments actually create more jobs than the tradi traditional investments. So that is another plus point uh, that we have. All in all, I'd say is that there is an opportunity for green recovery. Um, we should see more of it in ASEAN, but maybe we're not seeing enough. The two major ones I can think of in ASEAN are actually the Malaysian large-scale solar uh, project. Uh, in Indonesia, you have Surya Nusantara. Myanmar has done some uh, ground solar. But apart from that, uh, we don't see enough coming through. So it's an opportunity. We really should take advantage of it. All right. Uh, that is three. You want to uh, add I just want to uh, echo. I just wanted to echo because there's actually a tremendous uh, commercial opportunity that also exists in getting the transition right. And businesses which are ready for that should be able to pivot very quickly. Uh, so we need to make sure that money is being invested consistent with the transition. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so anybody would like to uh, uh, ask questions or provide comments uh, on the presentations or uh, any other issues related to the green economy and low carbon economy? Uh, sorry, Pak Yosa. I yeah. received a question uh, through WhatsApp actually from one of the participants. Okay. <laughs> so I will just read the question uh, right now. Uh, uh, the facts are obvious then, and we know that we need to be acting to uh, to halt the climate change crisis now. But that said, knowledge or awareness does not translate into action by governments. Why is this mm -hmm. so? So I think it's a general question to all three panelists. Right. Yeah, I can, I can handle because uh, we're also trying to engage uh, with the government on the multi-ministerial basis, private sector engaging with government. Um, you know, I think uh, working backwards, what does success look like? We want to be able to mainstream climate conversations. And for that, we need to have a description that's understandable and accurate so that all levels, because you could have a very high ranking ministry and really the civil servants within that might not fully be on board. And so we, we're still at the level where we're needing to uh, communicate and raise awareness. So I think that is something that um, I'll, I'll leave it to the other two panelists to jump in as well. But for us, that is one of the biggest challenges, raising awareness of climate risks. Maybe I can jump in first. Um, I think governments in ASEAN are in a very difficult position. I mean, on one hand, you've got to attend to segments of your economy that are actually quite backward. On the other hand, you have to worry about the future. Uh, and you know what we always say, 
at my institute, which is if you don't have today, you don't have tomorrow. So it's a very difficult balancing act for governments. Uh, and, but saying that, they try. So the question is really transition. Right? How can we get a good transition mechanism that allows um, the current situation to move to a better place within a predefined time? And we don't have transition standards. So if you look at the, um, I talked about the ACMF roadmap and the WCCMD report just now, both of them point to one thing, which is how do we Im introduce transition standards to encourage people not to be put off by perfect, but how can they make use of good? Uh, and that is something that is very important. Also, I think, as I, I pointed out just now, the massive challenges, say, it, even in a time of a pandemic and you need stimulus, is it social safety nets first or is it uh, great infrastructure for the future? And I think if people are starving, it's social safety nets first. And the problem is the capacity of the governance. Uh, and that's something which is very restricted. So it's, it's something we have to deal with. I, I think, um, you know, the question is, you know, how will governments take action? There's actually been a tremendous amount of work going on in the private sector front running in some in some countries the actions taking place i mean not not as much as many people would like but you would think governments would lead and the and the private sectors would follow but but the the governments had difficulties in many countries getting on track i think to the extent they have to spend money that's always going to be a big challenge um where you've seen the most success is in uh, imposing regulations in the future it doesn't directly cost money and the uh, companies to the extent they can't prevent the regulations from coming into play through their lobbying efforts, they just have to deal with it. And to the extent it's happening to everybody in their industry, at least it's a shared equally you know, level playing field, at least within their industry. So you see heavy regulation coming in the utilities industry, some of the automotive industry. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see, um, regulation driving a lot of change. Uh, many of us uh, on, at this meeting are, have economics backgrounds and we'd all love to see carbon prices, uh, carbon taxes rather uh, imposed. Uh, that's another method of, uh, uh, of driving change by governments that wouldn't cost anything. In fact, it could raise revenue. So you'd think that would be uh, you know, a win-win, but, but so far, it's been impossible to, to, to really implement that in a significant way in, in any economy without the uh, group, you know, those costs being perceived as passed on to consumers, and those consumers are highly influential uh, in, in the uh, a part of the electorate. And so that, that, that has not been successful. You know, my dream, I, I, Sunita put in a fair amount of information about carbon prices. I'm an economist, so I mean, that's my dream. But uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't know, even understand all, all the difficulties because it seems like the obvious way to go. But uh, uh, I haven't seen much progress there in, in scale yet. Okay. Uh, I think there is a, a question here uh, in the Q&A platforms uh, from Neil Silva. Uh, it said that uh, since the carbonizations will require extensive restructuring of existing power network and may enter costs beyond reach of low income household, how can we make sure green growth will not take away money intended for social welfare and increase social divides? Uh, or how do we, or uh, in put it another way, how do we democratize the development of prosumer sector? Uh, anybody? I think. Uh, uh, all of you already uh, touched upon the points uh, sometimes, but uh, if you would, would like to highlight it again and uh, respond, please do so. That uh, Sri or? Yeah, I think this is actually a, a very complicated question. And of course, Eugene has touched on it in terms of, uh, you know, the specific characteristics of this region, which is still developing and still needing to invest mm -hmm. in not just infrastructure, but also its social needs. So you have thinkers like uh, Bjorn Lomborg, who has also said, why don't we do some sort of rank ordering? You know, if we have limited resources, whether it's funding or even time and attention, then what, is, what are the things? Because, you know, when you're planning for managing risks, which are 30, 50, 100 years out, there's so many things that can go wrong with your climate modeling, with your assumptions. 
And um, is it better to invest in the resources, the talents, the human beings that we, the next generation that we have, and you know, and let um, let the solutions transpire as we're evolving. So it is actually a deeply complicated conversation. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of my presentation was about decarbonizing and uh, possibly even degrowth strategies that the planet simply cannot support population growth and GDP growth as, as it is presently being calculated. So how do we value ec ecosystem services? How do we do rank ordering of all the priorities? For example, getting rid of tuberculosis. So uh, it is a very complicated conversation. Uh, I'm here today just to talk about climate governance. <laughs> 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 anyway, anybody yes, else would... Dr. Yeah. Nam wants to speak, maybe uh, from uh, Peck Japan. Yeah. Uh, uh, you would like to speak? Yes, um, I, there was this question about government response. I was in the government a few years ago. I was Minister of Energy and I was <laughs> confronted uh, with that question. I was a green man. I wanted to, you know, go green quickly. But then I learned at the time that um, government is committed to making power available to everybody. And uh, by that means, uh, it has to be affordable. You know, we can build power for everybody, but uh, it has to be affordable. And I think Eugene mentioned this point about income factor. Now, in order to make it affordable, we cannot all go green. Uh, because the cost of the power by fossil fuel, particularly coal, is cheapest. You know, and uh, in the country like Thailand, we use a, a uniformity in price, single price, for everybody everywhere. So when we add the uh, green uh, generated power into the grid, Average becomes higher and higher and higher, you know. And therefore, we decided to go uh, gradually. Uh, at the moment, uh, fossil fuel is about 70%. And out of that 70%, ha almost half is from coal and the rest from natural gas. And the, the other 30% are from renewable. So we want to increase renewable gradually. Because, you know, if you know in the energy uh, economics, it, there are three A's. Availability, affordability, and acceptability. You know, people want to go all green, but they cannot afford it. <laughs> That's why you have to understand this uh, dilemma faced by governments. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naranjai. Um, uh, any other questions, uh, Muhammad? That, uh... In the chat box, there is this one question uh, from uh, Vincent. Uh, drop C, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to which extent would travel and tourism be negatively oh, affected by the desirable goals of reducing carbon emission? What to do to uh, what to do to reduce or soften this impact for tourism-dependent economies? Yeah, I think it's it's quite um, uh, quite important for the ASEAN countries, ASEAN economies. Uh, Mr. Eugene Wong, would you would you like to respond on this yeah. issue? Well. I think this is a question of uh, uh, collective as well as individual action. And um, so if you look at Lufthansa, uh, one of the things that they came up with to uh, allow people to travel a bit, a bit more guilt-free is to set off the carbon footprint from their travel. So you, you can buy credit somewhere and set it off. Um, but I, get, I guess for me, the important thing here is, one is that if people are aware of externalities, if you go to Japan, even a train trip, they'll tell you how much carbon footprint you've emitted as a result of it. So one is to create the awareness so people manage and they can do their personal offsets. Um, the second is really um, technology again. Uh, I think over time, things will change. We, you've probably heard that uh, in, in some of the Nordic countries, they're already looking at electric planes for short distances. I mean, the long distance ones will come. So it's, it's not a particular um, solution that we have today, right now. But with technology, I think we will. And I come back to this point where there are many things that we can't deal with today and we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. So what can you do in between? Again, it's back to uh, transition. It's back to how you can adapt, uh, mitigate and offset. So if we use this toolbox, uh, I, I think it's something that we need to start working harder on 
to use two boxes like that. And I just also wanted to say something about Neil's question. Neil, you asked a very uh, important question, which is an economics question we always ask, right? I mean, you have mutually exclusive choices. You have to make a choice. In this particular case where you're asking whether investment in energy grids, for example, would take away um, uh, capital from other uh, social aspects, ADB has actually produced a very interesting report where it talks about how um, particular uh, uh, stimulus actions can actually impact a broad range of social agenda items. So if you have a chance, please have a look at that. I think it's a very interesting uh, report and uh, it gives a lot of guidance in this uh, subject matter. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we are already uh, respond to all questions uh, in the uh, in the chat box and also the Q and A platforms. Uh, uh, if there is no other uh, question from the panelists, then I would like to ask uh, the the panelists uh, to uh, give some uh, one minute remarks, one minute final remarks or summary of the presentations. Uh, uh, now uh, I will start with uh, to with uh, Dr. Richard Kenton, please. Um, well, I'm not. I, I don't want to summarize the presentation. Um, I do uh, want to, you know, put a call for action to 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 PEC uh, and to think about uh, issues that that we may want to work on in this area where we have a contribution. And I, I think uh, one area is that. The, the coming carbon border tax adjustments. I mean, that is an area where Europe is likely going to take the lead. Um, and uh, it, it would be appropriate for the Asia Pacific to anticipate that. Um, not saying resist it, but, but just anticipate it and try to be a, a partner in, in figuring all that out. I don't, I don't have any particular ideas there, but I would encourage people to uh, to work on that at that topic who, who are more inclined. Okay, that in three. Um, I would summarize by saying that the transition we're facing is going to be one of the most, if not the most significant transformation mm. in economic history. Right. And uh, one of the insights that we should all take away today is that it's not just decarbonizing the economy in line with Paris, but it's also equally important to maintain our biodiversity, transform the world's food system, and maintain the carbon sinks that we have in our natural ecosystem. Uh, Mr. Eugene Wong? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, in particularly in ASEAN, we need a lot of policy direction because of the diversity. This year, uh, next year actually for 2021, I think we will see that coming through because we see the financial sector regulators all coming together. And the most important thing I would say in the next 12 months is for us to agree on a common um, definition. So a taxonomy is something which is critical for us. Okay, thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe that uh, all of you have enjoyed the uh, conversations uh, for the last uh, one hour. A uh, lot of things have been presented and discussed here uh, in these sessions. Uh, so, uh, it is hard for me actually to summarize all of them, uh, but I will pick up two basic uh, points uh, that we uh, perhaps uh, need to look at even more. Uh, the first one is that uh, we need government policy and instrument, uh, as well as also technology, uh, to support low carbon initiative. That includes also uh, the uh, measurement uh, initiative, the, the uh, uh, more some kind of uh, restrictions and uh, uh, incentive policy from the government. Uh, and and we we have to come up with uh, the a more implementation uh, implementable policy. Um, there is also uh, the second point is there is also uh, pre increasing pressure for transitions coming from the society and also from the market. But uh, the awareness, especially in this part of the world uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we still uh, need to work harder uh, to improve uh, to increase the awareness and improve uh, pressure, perhaps from the society and also from the uh, market and consumers. Uh, with uh, that remarks, I close my uh, the uh, the session uh, today this afternoon, and hopefully the what we discussed uh, and uh, so far would uh, would be uh, beneficial for us uh, to uh, to the policy development and also to shape the the economy in the region. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yosef. Thank you to, uh, to all panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yosef, esteemed panelists. Before we adjourn for the day, may I please request for the role players, Dr. Yosef, Dr. Richard, Datin Sri Sunita, and Mr. Eugene, to switch on or leave on your video for us to take a group photo. Okay. Again, to all other panelists, please switch off your videos for this. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Done. Thank yep. you all. Thank you. Thank that, you also for uh, you. all participants. Yep. Uh, that concludes well the day of the public yeah. webinar in conjunction with the 27 PCC general meeting. We thank you for your continued participation throughout the past few hours, and we look forward to welcoming you once again for plenary sessions four, five, and six tomorrow at 9 a.m. Malaysian time. You may access the webinar using the same Zoom link as today. And for speakers presenting tomorrow, could you please send over your talking points and or presentation slides to Louis Dennis at isis.org.my? That's L O U I S dot. D E N I S at isis.org.my. Thank you. And have a good day, afternoon, and night ahead. Thank you. Have a good day to all.